Selamat datang di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga lahir sejak tahun 1972 silam yang berdiri dengan semangat tinggi melahirkan generasi bangsa hebat dalam dunia perkembangan pendidikan kedokteran hewan di Indonesia. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga diarahkan pada pendidikan dokter hewan yang general professional qualification di lapangan yang menguasai bidang kesehatan hewan, produksi ternak, dan kesehatan masyarakat veteriner. FKH mempunyai beberapa program studi, yaitu program sarjana kedokteran hewan, program pendidikan profesi dokter hewan, dan beberapa program studi S2, yaitu Magister Biologi Reproduksi, Magister Ilmu Penyakit dan Kesehatan Masyarakat Veteriner, Magister Agribisnis Veteriner, Magister Ilmu Vaksinologi dan Imunoterapeutika, dan program studi doktoral Sains Veteriner. FKH juga mempunyai satu program studi kedokteran hewan berada di Banyuwangi, yaitu kita sebut dengan PSDKU Banyuwangi. FKH mempunyai 30 guru besar yang mempunyai kompetensi yang sesuai di bidangnya. FKH mempunyai kelas internasional, akreditasi internasional, dan mempunyai mahasiswa yang mendapatkan beasiswa Erlangga Development Scholarship untuk program studi S2 dan program studi doktoral. Para dosen mempunyai kontribusi besar dalam menghasilkan publikasi Scopus Research Collaboration dengan beberapa dosen baik perguruan tinggi di dalam dan tentunya para dosen yang berada di luar negeri. Dan para dosen menghasilkan beberapa paten yang sangat membanggakan. Dan tentunya ini akan memberikan profil FKH ke depan menjadi lebih bagus lagi dan tentunya akan menuju kepada Universitas Erlangga yang hebat. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan menjadi fakultas pilihan di mana dengan berbagai macam fasilitas yang representatif. Berbagai macam fasilitas ini menjadikan mahasiswa belajar lebih nyaman dan semangat. Keberadaan sarana ini mendukung proses pendidikan secara maksimal dan memberikan ruang eksplorasi kepada dunia kedokteran hewan yang lebih luas. Keberadaan alumni menjadi citra perguruan tinggi dalam keberhasilannya mencetak generasi hebat dalam dunia kerja. Saya ingin menjadi bagian di antaranya dengan memberikan impact positif terhadap reputasi fakultas maupun universitas dalam membangun jaringan yang lebih luas. Bagi saya, menempuh pendidikan di FKH UNER ini memberikan kesempatan dan keahlian sehingga saya dan mahasiswa lainnya juga bisa mengakses peluang dalam meningkatkan karir dan profesionalisme. Satu tempat di mana kita bisa belajar lebih adalah keberadaan Rumah Sakit Hewan Pendidikan Universitas Erlangga. Sebagai tempat magang dan praktik mahasiswa, baik S1 maupun profesi, bahkan S2 dan S3 dalam pelaksanaan riset. Sebagai contoh kolaborasi riset di bidang kedokteran dan juga melayani untuk masyarakat umum. Dengan tenaga dokter hewan dan para medis yang berpengalaman, di bawah bimbingan para guru besar yang ada, Gedung RSAP UNER menjadi salah satu gedung RSAP terbesar di Indonesia. RSAP UNER hadir dengan beragam alat pendukung berteknologi tinggi dalam memberikan hasil maksimal dan proses pendidikan dan pelayanan. Prestasi tertinggimu melalui belajar dengan kurikulum yang berkualitas dan terukur. Kegiatan organisasi mahasiswa yang menarik 
dan bimbingan dari para alumni yang sukses di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Dengan kerja keras, semangat, kami siapkan fasilitas, dosen, dan tenaga kependidikan, serta atmosfer keilmuan kampus yang berkualitas sesuai dengan kebutuhan Anda dan kita semua. Nikmati segala kemudahan proses belajar Anda melalui kerjasama nasional dan internasional yang telah kami bangun. Bersama Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Air Langga, India ada menjadi nyala. Selamat datang di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Air Langga. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga lahir sejak tahun 1972 silam yang berdiri dengan semangat tinggi melahirkan generasi bangsa hebat dalam dunia perkembangan pendidikan kedokteran hewan di Indonesia. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga diarahkan pada pendidikan dokter hewan yang general professional qualification di lapangan yang menguasai bidang kesehatan hewan, produksi ternak, dan kesehatan masyarakat veteriner. FKH mempunyai beberapa program studi, yaitu program sarjana kedokteran hewan, program pendidikan profesi dokter hewan, dan beberapa program studi S2, yaitu Magister Biologi Reproduksi, Magister Ilmu Penyakit dan Kesehatan Masyarakat Veteriner, Magister Agribisnis Veteriner, Magister Ilmu Vaksinologi dan Imunoterapeutika, dan program studi doktoral Sains Veteriner. FKH juga mempunyai satu program studi kedokteran hewan berada di Banyuwangi, yaitu kita sebut dengan PSDKU Banyuwangi. FKH mempunyai 30 guru besar yang mempunyai kompetensi yang sesuai di bidangnya. FKH mempunyai kelas internasional, akreditasi internasional, dan mempunyai mahasiswa yang mendapatkan beasiswa Erlangga Development Scholarship untuk program studi S2 dan program studi doktoral. Para dosen mempunyai kontribusi besar dalam menghasilkan publikasi Scopus Research Collaboration dengan beberapa dosen baik perguruan tinggi di dalam dan tentunya para dosen yang berada di luar negeri. Dan para dosen menghasilkan beberapa paten yang sangat membanggakan. Dan tentunya ini akan memberikan profil FKH ke depan menjadi lebih bagus lagi dan tentunya akan menuju kepada Universitas Erlangga yang hebat. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan menjadi fakultas pilihan di mana dengan berbagai macam fasilitas yang representatif. Berbagai macam fasilitas ini menjadikan mahasiswa belajar lebih nyaman dan semangat. Keberadaan sarana ini mendukung proses pendidikan secara maksimal dan memberikan ruang eksplorasi kepada dunia kedokteran hewan yang lebih luas. Keberadaan alumni menjadi citra perguruan tinggi dalam keberhasilannya mencetak generasi hebat dalam dunia kerja. Saya ingin menjadi bagian di antaranya dengan memberikan impact positif terhadap reputasi fakultas maupun universitas dalam membangun jaringan yang lebih luas. Bagi saya, menempuh pendidikan di FKH UNER ini memberikan kesempatan dan keahlian sehingga saya dan mahasiswa lainnya juga bisa mengakses peluang dalam meningkatkan karir dan profesionalisme. Satu tempat di mana kita bisa belajar lebih adalah keberadaan Rumah Sakit Hewan Pendidikan Universitas Erlangga. Sebagai tempat magang dan praktik mahasiswa, baik S1 maupun profesi, bahkan S2 dan S3 dalam pelaksanaan riset. 
sebagai contoh kolaborasi riset di bidang kedokteran dan juga melayani untuk masyarakat umum. Dengan tenaga dokter hewan dan para medis yang berpengalaman, di bawah bimbingan para guru besar yang ada, gedung RSAP UNER menjadi salah satu gedung RSAP terbesar di Indonesia. RSAP UNER hadir dengan beragam alat pendukung, berteknologi tinggi, dalam memberikan hasil maksimal dan proses pendidikan dan pelayanan. Prestasi tertinggimu melalui belajar dengan kurikulum yang berkualitas dan terukur. Kegiatan organisasi mahasiswa yang menarik dan bimbingan dari para alumni yang sukses di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Dengan kerja keras, semangat, kami siapkan fasilitas, dosen, dan tenaga kependidikan, serta atmosfer keilmuan kampus yang berkualitas sesuai dengan kebutuhan Anda dan kita semua. Nikmati segala kemudahan proses belajar Anda melalui kerjasama nasional dan internasional yang telah kami bangun. Bersama Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Air Langga, Selamat datang di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga lahir sejak tahun 1972 silam yang berdiri dengan semangat tinggi melahirkan generasi bangsa hebat dalam dunia perkembangan pendidikan kedokteran hewan di Indonesia. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga diarahkan pada pendidikan dokter hewan yang general professional qualification di lapangan yang menguasai bidang kesehatan hewan, produksi ternak, dan kesehatan masyarakat veteriner. FKH mempunyai beberapa program studi, yaitu program sarjana kedokteran hewan, program pendidikan profesi dokter hewan, dan beberapa program studi S2, yaitu Magister Biologi Reproduksi, Magister Ilmu Penyakit dan Kesehatan Masyarakat Veteriner, Magister Agribisnis Veteriner, Magister Ilmu Vaksinologi dan Imunoterapetika, dan program studi doktoral Sains Veteriner. FKH juga mempunyai satu program studi kedokteran hewan berada di Banyuwangi, yaitu kita sebut dengan PSDKU Banyuwangi. FKH mempunyai 30 guru besar yang mempunyai kompetensi yang sesuai di bidangnya. FKH mempunyai kelas internasional, akreditasi internasional, dan mempunyai mahasiswa yang mendapatkan beasiswa Erlangga Development Scholarship untuk program studi S2 dan program studi doktoral. Para dosen mempunyai kontribusi besar dalam menghasilkan publikasi Scopus Riset Collaboration dengan beberapa dosen baik perguruan tinggi di dalam dan tentunya para dosen yang berada di luar negeri. Dan para dosen menghasilkan beberapa paten yang sangat membanggakan. Dan tentunya ini akan memberikan profil FKH ke depan menjadi lebih bagus lagi dan tentunya akan menuju kepada Universitas Erlangga yang hebat. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan menjadi fakultas pilihan di mana dengan berbagai macam fasilitas yang representatif. Berbagai macam fasilitas ini menjadikan mahasiswa belajar lebih nyaman dan semangat. Keberadaan sarana ini mendukung proses pendidikan secara maksimal dan memberikan ruang eksplorasi kepada dunia kedokteran hewan yang lebih luas.
keberadaan alumni menjadi citra perguruan tinggi dalam keberhasilannya mencetak generasi hebat dalam dunia kerja. Saya ingin menjadi bagian di antaranya dengan memberikan impact positif terhadap reputasi fakultas maupun universitas dalam membangun jaringan yang lebih luas. Bagi saya, menempuh pendidikan di FKH UNER ini memberikan kesempatan dan keahlian sehingga saya dan mahasiswa lainnya juga bisa mengakses peluang dalam meningkatkan karir dan profesionalisme. Satu tempat di mana kita bisa belajar lebih adalah keberadaan Rumah Sakit Hewan Pendidikan Universitas Erlangga. Sebagai tempat magang dan praktik mahasiswa, baik S1 maupun profesi, bahkan S2 dan S3 dalam pelaksanaan riset. Sebagai contoh kolaborasi riset di bidang kedokteran dan juga melayani untuk masyarakat umum. Dengan tenaga dokter hewan dan para medis yang berpengalaman, di bawah bimbingan para guru besar yang ada, gedung RSAP UNER menjadi salah satu gedung RSAP terbesar di Indonesia. RSAP UNER hadir dengan beragam alat pendukung berteknologi tinggi dalam memberikan hasil maksimal dan proses pendidikan dan pelayanan. Prestasi tertinggimu melalui belajar dengan kurikulum yang berkualitas dan terukur. Kegiatan organisasi mahasiswa yang menarik dan bimbingan dari para alumni yang sukses di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Dengan kerja keras, semangat, kami siapkan fasilitas, dosen, dan tenaga kependidikan serta atmosfer keilmuan kampus yang berkualitas sesuai dengan kebutuhan Anda dan kita semua. Nikmati segala kemudahan proses belajar Anda melalui kerjasama nasional dan internasional yang telah kami bangun. Bersama Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Air Langga, Selamat datang di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga lahir sejak tahun 1972 silam yang berdiri dengan semangat tinggi melahirkan generasi bangsa hebat dalam dunia perkembangan pendidikan kedokteran hewan di Indonesia. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga diarahkan pada pendidikan dokter hewan yang general professional qualification di lapangan yang menguasai bidang kesehatan hewan, produksi ternak, dan kesehatan masyarakat veteriner. FKH mempunyai beberapa program studi, yaitu program sarjana kedokteran hewan, program pendidikan profesi dokter hewan, dan beberapa program studi S2, yaitu Magister Biologi Reproduksi, Magister Ilmu Penyakit dan Kesehatan Masyarakat Veteriner, Magister Agribisnis Veteriner, Magister Ilmu Vaksinologi dan Imunoterapeutika, dan program studi doktoral Sains Veteriner. FKH juga mempunyai satu program studi kedokteran hewan berada di Banyuwangi, yaitu kita sebut dengan PSDKU Banyuwangi. FKH mempunyai 30 guru besar yang mempunyai kompetensi yang sesuai di bidangnya. FKH mempunyai kelas internasional, akreditasi internasional, dan mempunyai mahasiswa yang mendapatkan beasiswa Erlangga Development Scholarship untuk program studi S2 dan program studi doktoral. Para dosen mempunyai kontribusi besar dalam menghasilkan publikasi Scopus, Research Collaboration, 
dengan beberapa dosen baik perguruan tinggi di dalam dan tentunya uh, para dosen yang berada di luar negeri dan para dosen menghasilkan beberapa paten yang sangat membanggakan dan tentunya ini akan memberikan profil FKH ke depan menjadi lebih bagus lagi dan tentunya akan menuju kepada Universitas Erlangga yang hebat. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan menjadi fakultas pilihan di mana dengan berbagai macam fasilitas yang representatif. Berbagai macam fasilitas ini menjadikan mahasiswa belajar lebih nyaman dan semangat. Keberadaan sarana ini mendukung proses pendidikan secara maksimal. Oke, okay, thank you. Eksplorasi kepada dunia kedokteran hewan yang lebih luas. Thank you. Dokter Yuta. Hai. How are you? I'm fine. And you? How are you? Oh, you you're welcome. I'm very happy to be invited. Maybe we we'll start uh, nine o'clock. Okay. So I'm waiting here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. See you. See you later. Kesempatan dan keahlian sehingga saya dan mahasiswa lainnya juga bisa mengakses peluang dalam meningkatkan karir dan profesionalisme. Satu tempat di mana kita bisa belajar lebih adalah keberadaan Rumah Sakit Hewan Pendidikan Universitas Erlangga sebagai tempat magang dan praktik mahasiswa baik S1 maupun profesi bahkan S2 dan S3 dalam pelaksanaan riset sebagai contoh kolaborasi riset di bidang kedokteran dan juga melayani untuk masyarakat umum dengan tenaga dokter hewan dan para medis yang berpengalaman di bawah bimbingan para guru besar yang ada Gedung RSAP UNER menjadi salah satu gedung RSAP terbesar di Indonesia. RSAP UNER hadir dengan beragam alat pendukung berteknologi tinggi dalam memberikan hasil maksimal dan proses pendidikan dan pelayanan. Prestasi tertinggimu melalui belajar dengan kurikulum yang berkualitas dan terukur. Kegiatan organisasi mahasiswa yang menarik dan bimbingan dari para alumni yang sukses di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Dengan kerja keras, semangat, kami siapkan fasilitas, dosen, dan tenaga kependidikan, serta atmosfer keilmuan kampus yang berkualitas sesuai dengan kebutuhan Anda dan kita semua. Nikmati segala kemudahan proses belajar Anda melalui kerjasama nasional dan internasional yang telah kami bangun. Bersama Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Airlangga, impian Anda menjadi nyata. Selamat datang di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Airlangga. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga lahir sejak tahun 1972 silam yang berdiri dengan semangat tinggi melahirkan generasi bangsa hebat dalam dunia perkembangan pendidikan kedokteran hewan di Indonesia. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga diarahkan pada pendidikan dokter hewan yang general professional qualification di lapangan yang menguasai bidang kesehatan hewan, produksi ternak, dan kesehatan masyarakat veteriner. 
UKH mempunyai beberapa program studi yaitu program sarjana kedokteran hewan, program pendidikan profesi dokter hewan, dan beberapa program studi S2 yaitu Magister Biologi Reproduksi, Magister Ilmu Penyakit dan Kesehatan Masyarakat Veteriner, Magister Agribisnis Veteriner, Magister Ilmu Vaksinologi dan Imunoterapeutika, dan program studi doktoral Sains Veteriner. FKH juga mempunyai satu program studi kedokteran hewan berada di Banyuwangi yaitu kita sebut dengan PSDKU Banyuwangi. FKH mempunyai 30 guru besar yang mempunyai kompetensi yang sesuai di bidangnya. FKH mempunyai kelas internasional, akreditasi internasional, dan mempunyai mahasiswa yang mendapatkan beasiswa Erlangga Development Scholarship untuk program studi S2 dan program studi doktoral. Para dosen mempunyai kontribusi besar dalam menghasilkan publikasi Scopus Research Collaboration dengan beberapa dosen baik perguruan tinggi di dalam dan tentunya para dosen yang berada di luar negeri. Dan para dosen menghasilkan beberapa paten yang sangat membanggakan dan tentunya ini akan memberikan profil FKH ke depan menjadi lebih bagus lagi dan tentunya akan menuju kepada Universitas Erlangga yang hebat. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan menjadi fakultas pilihan di mana dengan berbagai macam fasilitas yang representatif. Berbagai macam fasilitas ini menjadikan mahasiswa belajar lebih nyaman dan semangat. Keberadaan sarana ini mendukung proses pendidikan secara maksimal dan memberikan ruang eksplorasi kepada dunia kedokteran hewan yang lebih luas. Keberadaan alumni menjadi citra perguruan tinggi dalam keberhasilannya mencetak generasi hebat dalam dunia kerja. Saya ingin menjadi bagian di antaranya dengan memberikan impact positif terhadap reputasi fakultas maupun universitas dalam membangun jaringan yang lebih luas. Bagi saya, menempuh pendidikan di FKH UNER ini memberikan kesempatan dan keahlian sehingga saya dan mahasiswa lainnya juga bisa mengakses peluang dalam meningkatkan karir dan profesionalisme. Satu tempat di mana kita bisa belajar lebih adalah keberadaan Rumah Sakit Hewan Pendidikan Universitas Erlangga sebagai tempat okay, magang you, dan praktik mahasiswa baik S1 maupun profesi bahkan S2 dan S3 dalam Selamat pagi Dokter Bimo. kedokteran dan juga melayani untuk masyarakat umum. Selamat pagi Pak Sukma, Dokter Sukma. Oke, okay. we prepare. You, we will start deh. Oke, okay, no problem. Dokter Helmi, I introduce Yuta Kanai. He is uh, my, my friend. <laughs> Yuta, how are you? Yeah, fine. Thank you, Bimo. Maybe uh, five years ago, we have planned to make a research proposal about the petrovin virus. All right? Yeah. Oke, okay. Dr. Kania, please start. Baik, sebelum memulai, saya akan membacakan tata tertib seminar pada pagi hari ini. Untuk tata tertib yang pertama yaitu partisipan dimohon untuk menggunakan virtual background yang telah diberikan melalui chat. Dan yang kedua, untuk selama guest lecture, pertanyaan bisa disampaikan melalui chat atau disampaikan langsung pada saat diskusi. Partisipan diharapkan mematikan mic selama guest lecture berlangsung. Dan partisipan dapat mengajukan pertanyaan dengan menggunakan fitur raise hand pada saat sesi diskusi. Dan yang terakhir, partisipan diharapkan mengisi Google Form yang akan dibagi melalui chat box untuk absensi untuk pembagian sertifikat.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kania, and today I will guide you through the Veterinary Basic Medicine's online learning with the guest lecture, Dr. Yuta Kanai, DVM, PhD. So today's topic is about the molecular biology of bedborne virus. Because over the past several decades, deadly human viruses, including Ebola virus, Marburg virus, Nipah virus, SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2 have emerged, and they are considered to be linked to the bed host. Bats are the second most diverse mammalian order on Earth after rodents. Compromising approximately 22% of mammalian species and the high diversity of pet species support the harbor various of viruses. This seminar will begin with the descriptions of the bed viruses and the current understanding in the molecular mechanisms underlying the persistent virus infections in bats. In the later half of the seminar, recent findings of the Nelson Bay Rio virus detected from human and bats in Southeast Asian countries will be presented, including in Indonesia. Next, singing national anthem, Indonesia Raya, continued by Himna Erlangga, and please hand on chest when Himna Erlangga is being played. The time is given.
Next, we will enter the opening remarks by Vice Dean Tree, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, to Dr. Mustafa Helmi Effendi, DTA PhDVM. The time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let us give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given various pleasure on all of us. One of the favor, now we feel it is a blessing of help so that we can hold this guest lecture. Furthermore, let me express my appreciation and gratitude and thanks to the chairman of the committee and the entire guest lecture committee who have prepared this must awaited event. This is very important for me to convey considering that the basic veterinary medicine division is working hard to achieve public recognition as a quality division in Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Erlangga University, in implementing a quality management system toward the world-class university. The qualities above are qualities that are balanced throughout, we call in Bahasa Indonesia, Tridharma Perguruan Tinggi, that consists of education, research, and community services, while maintaining the noble character within carry it out. In particular, let me also express my gratitude to the head of the basic veterinary, basic veterinary medicine division, Dr. Rohma Kurnia Santi, DVM Magister Sign, and also Dr. Eduardus Bimo Aksono, DVM Magister of Health and other professor and senior who have the pleasure to be present on Zoom online to make this event got a success. The guest lecture theme, Molecular Biology of Bad Bone Viruses, of course, it will be useful for development of veterinary science in the future. Therefore, a guest lecture and system improvement, the learning need to be done continuously so that the application in the field above can be understood by students and learners. This guest lecture must be able to encourage researcher and veterinary education practitioner to combine this field. So it is easily understood by student, able to carry out research and implementing application in the appropriate technology. Finally, I would like to thank Q, Dr. Yuta Kanai from Osaka University for giving presentation in guest lecture held by the Basic Veterinary Medicine Division with the hope that this will be give enlightenment for us, especially those who are always involved in research, learning, and the application of veterinary field in our respective lives. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Helmi, for the speech. And now we will continue to taking photo session and I will guide through the screen. Please, ladies and gentlemen, turn on the camera. For the first page. Okay, one, two, three. Second page. Uh, one, two, three. 
Okay, third page. One, two, three. Fourth page. One, two, three. Fifth page. One, two, three. Sixth page. One, two, three. Seventh page. One, two, three. Last page. Eighth page. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. Before we enter the first session, I will read the curriculum vitae of Dr. Yuta Kanai. Current biography of Dr. Yuta Kanai, Associate Professor, Research Institute for Microbial Disease, Osaka University, Japan. Education, 1996, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, Hokkaido University. 2007, PhD, Hokkaido University. Research experience, 2007, Postdoctoral Fellow, Rakunogakun University. 2008, Postdoctoral Fellow, Research Institute for Microbial Disease, Osaka University. 2010, Postdoctoral Fellow, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, UK. 2012, Postdoctoral Fellow, Research Institute for Microbial Disease, Osaka University. 2014, Assistant Professor, Research Institute for Microbial Disease, Osaka University. 2020, Associate Professor, Research Institute for Microbial Disease, Osaka University. Award, 2015, Excellent Researcher Prize, Research Institute for Microbial Disease, Osaka University. Dr. Kanai is a specialist of the reverse genetics of RNA viruses, which is the technology to generate gene-engineered recombinant virus from the artificial gene. His recent outstanding achievement is the development of reverse genetic system of the rotavirus in 2017. Using reverse genetic system, Dr. Kanai and his team generating numerous gene-engineered viruses for the understanding of molecular biology of rotavirus and Nelson Bay rheovirus, which is a pathogenic virus isolated from fruit bed. To Dr. Yuta Kanai, the first session will begin now. The time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So I will share my slide. So do you see Bimo, my slide? Okay. Is it fine? Okay, okay. Fine. it's clear. Fine, okay. fine. Clear, clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Kanya, for the kind of introduction. So good morning, everyone. So I'm today so happy to have this opportunity to talk in Iranga University. I appreciate my friend Bimo Aksono for giving me this chance and also appreciate to the staffs of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. And I met Dr. Bimo Aksono in, so it was 2014 in Iowranga University uh, when I visited the Institute of Tropical Disease for different purposes. So in that time, I asked uh, one Japanese researcher in ITD for somebody specialist of bat biology and Bimo was introduced. So today I'm so pleased to invite you to this occasion. So now it's time, so let me start a lecture. So today I'm going to talk about the molecular biology of bat bone viruses. So in the first session, deadly viruses with high mortalities will be introduced. And after the short break, then in the second session, I will talk about my own research regarding Nelson Bay real virus, which is the high pathogenic bat bone virus found in Southeastern Asian countries. So uh, just for a moment. So yes. Okay, so let me start. So 
Here is the graph, uh, the list of the pathogenic viruses with the highest mortalities. So uh, here is the Mar Marburg and Ebola viruses. They are the famous for the highest fatality among the human virus histories. And both, both viruses distribute only in Africa. And you may know another uh, the strain, the low pathogenic Ebola virus reston strain, uh, which are endemic in Philippines. So this is uh, different from the, this African Ebola viruses. So reston Ebola viruses is not included in today's seminar. And Nipah and Hendra viruses were also discovered in the uh, 1990s in the Malaysia and Australia. And you also know the deadly avian influenza viruses, the, such uh, H5N1 or H7N9, uh, mainly uh, found in the China and caused the lethal infection in humans since 2000. And MERS and SARS are the coronavirus related to the COVID-19. And here is the COVID-19. This is now as a very high pathogenic coronavirus in the human history, the average fatality is 2%. Is the 2% is quite higher than the common human viruses, but in comparison with to these deadly viruses, it look nothing, okay? Then, the interestingly, the many of these high pathogenic viruses are related to bat host, except for the two avian influenza viruses. So, but it does not mean that people get virus infection directly from bat, but there are many complicated relationships between the host and pathogens. The common features of these deadly viruses are all of them are zoonotic or originated from animal viruses. The another characters of these viruses that they are, or they are the emerging viruses uh, found after 20th century. So it means that that before uh, the, the rate of the 20th centuries, nobody knew about the presence of these viruses. So in this seminar, I'm going to focus on the seven viruses, including Nipah, Hendra, Marburg, Ebola, SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. And they are classified into only the three clusters of Henipah virus, and Fira virus, and Corona virus. So, there are many uh, outbreaks uh, of the coronaviruses in the last Samzi case, but nobody knows why these coronaviruses repeatedly cause outbreaks every, every several years. But now the researchers become thinking that the next outbreak will be occur in some years later by novel coronavirus. And but uh, is uh, now considered as a unique virus host for the pathogens. At the bat, bat are the very uh, diverse species. This is the second diverse mammalian species uh, following the rodents. Over the 1,200 uh, species of bat are recorded. And bat are uh, unique characters different from other mammals that they enjoy the re uh, remarkable longevity, live in the large colonies. And the bat are now uh, with uh, less risk of the tumor genesis. And but uh, uh, of course you know that uh, only the flying mammals and they can travel long distance and disseminate the viruses. The most important things uh, of the bat, uh, the virus, uh, the the, pass, uh, the host of the uh, deadly virus, uh, deadly viruses, that the bat are considered to be the tolerance to deadly viruses. So in other words. The hypothetic viruses, such as the Ebola virus infection, do not cause fatal infection, rather, but maintain those viruses without any symptoms. All these features that, uh, that bias, but, but present a significant potential source of emerging infectious diseases. So to date, the, the more than thousands of new but associated viral species have been discovered from at least, uh, but so at least 28 diverse virus families have been found from bat. This number is closely uh, related with the diverse uh, species of the bat and believed to be remarkably higher than other mammalian hosts. Although uh, the vast majority of these virus species are not related to human infections, but there could be a possibility that one day 
one of these bat specific viruses evolved for adaptation to humans by chance and caused pandemic. So uh, in the first session of the seminar, I'm going to talk start, uh, I'm going to start with the COVID-19 and then talk about the liver and viruses and Marburg and Ebola virus. And at, at the end, the recent progress underlying the molecular mechanisms about the tolerance of bad to pathogenic viruses are discussed. So let me start with COVID-19. Uh, so it is also called as the SARS-CoV-2, but uh, here I use COVID-19. So, uh, so here is a very small letter. Uh, this is the snash, snapshot of my email box. So I registered to the ProMed email, so which sent the information of the infectious disease worldwide every day. So for example, here you see uh, the email entitled the Poliomyelitis Update in Pakistan uh, sent in the 28 December, 2019, or another email the measles update, okay? And here you see on the email uh, I can uh, that I got on the 31st, uh, 31st of December, 2019, and I diagnosed the pneumonia. Uh, within this email, here is a description that Wuhan unexplained pneumonia has been isolated. So this is the very first sign of the COVID-19 and you know well what happened after this. And based on the previous experience on the SARS in Hong Kong 2002, so after the outbreaks uh, of COVID-19, the researchers uh, soon began to uh, start the hunting of the virus among the wild animals. And then it was a not long time before the coronavirus uh, similar to COVID-19 were found in, but were in the pangolin. This, Parogenetic tree was uh, made by the, uh, the genome, sequencing, genome sequence of the virus from human and bat and pangolin. And this tree suggested that the COVID-19 from human is very close to the coronavirus uh, from the bat or pangolin. Thus, uh, in the very early time of the COVID-19 outbreak in 2020, it became a common fact that the COVID-19 is originated from bat or pangolin. But uh, you should be a bit careful to read the phylogenetic tree because the phylogenetic relationship varies based on the viral gene analyzed. The left phylogenetic tree is uh, the constructed using the whole viral gene of the COVID-19 and COVID-19-like viruses from human, bat, and pangolin. And in this tree, so you see the very close relationship between the human and the bat viruses, and the pangolin viruses bit apart. But on the right uh, tree is made by the genome sequence of the spike protein of the uh, COVID-19. The spike protein is a cell attaching protein. Uh, it's locating on the surface of the virus particle. And during the virus entry steps, the, the spike protein binds to cell surface receptor. And because the interaction between the spike protein and the cell surface receptor is essential step, the genome sequence of the spike protein is considered as a host tropism determinant factor. So in the right phylogenetic tree, uh, the constructed on the spike protein gene. So you see the pangolin virus is more closer to the human viruses rather than the bat virus. But uh, it is still a bit too early to conclude that someone got COVID-19 virus directly from bat. So here is the actual sequence comparison of the partial sequence of the COVID-19 spike protein from human, bat, and pangolin. Uh, so based on my experience, so I'm sure that uh, they are, these sequences are very close. And it was, it is sure that the human virus is uh, evolved from the bat viruses. However, that, uh, you must notice that the genome sequence of these viruses are not identical. And there are considerable differences between the, uh, these sequences. And such nucleotide mutations occur spontaneously as, uh, you know, uh, 
by the example of the emergence of the COVID-19 Delta uh, strain. However, based on the standard mutation rate of the RNA viruses, the mutations of these numbers of nucleotides should require some decays. So indicating that the human COVID-19 and bat uh, COVID-19 like viruses are apart in many years of evolution time. So far, uh, the exact uh, identical human type of COVID-19 virus was not isolated from the bat or no other wild animals. So that's, I can say that uh, it could be true that COVID-19 virus of the human is originated from bat coronaviruses, but it may be event uh, in a long time ago. So currently, the direct link between the human virus and the bat virus is uh, still missing. The what, but the uh, one hypothesis is that human gut, human gut uh, ancestral virus from bat a uh, very long time ago without notice and probably without symptoms. And then the virus evolved for adaptation in the humans and caused the emergence, uh, emergent outbreak in the end of 2019. And once the virus adapted to human body, the virus adaptation is accelerated and more adapted uh, strains such as Delta strain emerged. The another hypothesis is that the ancestor of the COVID-19 was amplified in the bat, the pangolin, or maybe in the unidentified animals. And uh, the, uh, the new, the human adapted virus emerged and transmitted to human yeah. in the early 20. And an important thing that we must consider is that human rarely get the chance to for close contact to a bat. So as in the example of in the SARS in Hong Kong 2002 or MERS in the Middle East in 2012. In both cases, similar viruses were detected from bat and Tibet or the bat or camel. So because this uh, civet or camels are more closer to humans than bad, so it is uh, well accepted that uh, both viruses were originated from, uh, yes, this has maybe originated from bat, but the direct transmission may be occurred by a civet or camels. So in this seminar later, I will also introduce the cases of Nipah viruses and Ebola viruses. The, this kind of intermediate host a very important factor considering how bat virus is transmitted to the humans. Then we move on to the Nipah virus and Hendra virus. And Nipah and Hendra virus has caused outbreaks in Southeast Asia and Australia since 1990s. And both viruses belong to the family, the Paramyxoviridae, uh, which is the same family to the, for example, measles viruses. However, these Nipah and Hendra viruses were different from other known viruses, thus the new genus Henipa virus was established. The first Hendra virus outbreaks occurred in 1994 in East Australia, a town of Hendra. This virus was isolated from human and horses with respiratory and neurologic manifestations. So firstly, the virus was constantly transmitted from host to humans, but later the Hendra virus was isolated from Trapp's bat, uh, Frank Fox. Thus, now the natural host of Hendra virus is considered as bat and occasionally transmitted to hosts and humans. The subsequent outbreaks occurred in mainly among uh, horses, but in humans, the, since uh, 1994, there are several cases record, recorded, but the only the total seven cases of human infections have been reported. But the pathogenicity of the human have been high in every outbreaks and high fatality are recorded in both human and horse. The Nipah virus is very genetically close to the human viruses, but the risk of the Nipah virus is uh, quite higher than the Hendra virus. The first outbreak of Nipah virus occurred in respiratory and neurological disorders in human and pigs in Malaysia in 1999. 
In this outbreak, the virus isolated from human and pigs are named the Nipah virus uh, according to the, uh, the place that the virus was uh, the place uh, isolated uh, in the village of the Sungai Nipah in Malaysia. In this outbreak, the nearly the 300 uh, human patients uh, with more than 100 deaths were uh, recorded. The symptoms in pigs were mild in comparison to the human, but uh, the more than the millions of pigs were killed to stop the endemic. And since this outbreak in 1999, no subsequent cases were being reported in Malaysia. In 1999, the similar outbreaks occurred in Singapore, uh, so here in the same year, year. And after these outbreaks, to find out the natural host of Nipah viruses, the researchers started the epidemiological survey on the wildlife. So finally, the anti-Nipah antibody were the Nipah virus genome, but were the, uh, the infectious Nipah virus was isolated from back in the Malaysia, Thailand, and Cambodia. And this is more important things to you is that anti-Nipah virus antibody were detected in Kalimantan, so in this survey, the Nipah virus antibody was detected only from the large fruit bat, but not from the small, uh, small fruit bat or nor uh, from pigs. So now it is well established that bat, uh, the, especially the large flying fox are the natural host of uh, Nipah virus. The Nipah virus infection uh, begins with the common cold-like symptoms, such as fever, headache and respiratory symptoms. So uh, it is not easy to diagnose the Nipah virus infection by the early clinical manifestations. But uh, within a few days, the symptoms progresses to the neurological disorders, such as disorientation, uh, drowsiness, confusion, seizures, and finally coma and die. And some victims show the brain swelling indicated the presence of the encephalitis. Now, so it is estimated that the Nipah virus directly transmit to human via urine or the feces, or also it is possible by the contact with the fruit eaten by bat. So actually the virus genome was detected from fruit eaten uh, by bat. And also uh, the infected pig uh, will become the the infectious source. And once human get the infection from these animals, the human to human transmission seems to occur very efficiently. So uh, the outbreaks in Malaysia in 1999 continued for several months. And there is a clear peak in the March in 1999, yeah? Uh, it was he speculated that the active human to human transmission occurred during this peak. And, but you also notice that the former outbreak in the Perak, yeah, the, in the Perak state, uh, shown in the blue bar, did not cause the large outbreaks. So there is no scientific evidence for the different, to explain the difference between the outbreaks in this Perak outbreak were in the outbreak in the uh, Negri Sumbira. But uh, from these graphs, uh, I can guess that the outbreaks in the Perak uh, state is, uh, was caused by the different, a bit different strain of the Nipah viruses, uh, which is not uh, fully adaptive to the humans, but uh, the virus strain, uh, which caused the outbreaks in this uh, yellow, the, in the state of Negri Sumbira, is was more adapted and caused the uh, human to human transfection easily. So after the end of the outbreaks in Malaysia and Singapore in 1999, the center of the Nipah virus outbreaks moved to the India and Bangladesh subsequently. Uh, so, so until now the sporadic outbreaks of Nipah virus occurred in India in Bang and Bangladesh every some years. And fatality rate, as shown in the orange bar, is always very high. So the fatality of the Nipah virus infection are usually described at the 40 to 75%. So 
So here is a zero epidemiological study for anti-nipavirus antibody in bat in Bangladesh conducted in 2006 to 2011. So in this survey, the total 883 bat in six locations were examined. The substantial zero prevalence was recorded in all bat colonies and both in juvenile and adult. The trend of the high zero prevalence in Adult, uh, yeah, adult, the more than the juvenile is a common uh, feature of the for many pathogens. So it is simply that because the adult have more chance for infection in its life. Although the pathogenesis of Nipah virus in bat have not been evaluated, but this result implies that those that survived Nipah virus infection uh, in past, uh, but was not killed and developed antibody. And based on the high prevalence of the anti nipa uh, virus antibody among bad populations, it is thought that the Nipah virus have maintained stably uh, among the bad populations, and sometimes virus are transmitted to humans accidentally. So now we, we move on to the Ebola virus and Marburg virus. Both Ebola and Marburg virus belong to the filoviruses. The filo yeah, means a threat in Latin word. Indeed, the morphology of the filovirus is quite different from the standard round shaped virus particle. So this is the electron mi microscopy image. However, the fil uh, if you see the uh, filovirus billion carefully, so it has an envelope and with a spike protein on the surface of the virus uh, particle. Mm -hmm. And inside the billion, it contains the virus genome. So it, this is essentially the same structure to the common uh, round shape enveloped viruses. And there are two, uh, the, you know, the unfamous viruses of the uh, viruses, uh, the name to Leoview viruses or Mengla, uh, Mengla dialo viruses. These two viruses are only found from bat, and currently they are recognized as not potential to human infection. The Marburg virus was firstly identified during the laboratory incident at Marburg, Germany in 1967. The outbreak was happened among the laboratory workers using the African green monkey imported from Uganda. The two, out, uh, two large outbreaks that occurred in simultaneously in Marburg and Frankfurt in Germany, and also in the Belgrade, Serbia in the same year was recorded. And in this incident, the total 31 patients were infected and seven among them were died. And from the patient, the Nobel Filovirus was isolated and named after the location of the uh, Marburg. And the new viruses, the Marburg virus was described. So after the infection of Marburg viruses, the symptoms onset is sudden and marked by the fever and severe headache and malaise. Oops. And because uh, the designs of the, the early manifestation is uh, very similar to the other infectious diseases such as malaria or typhoid fever, the clinical diagnosis of disease is difficult, especially if only the single case is involved. The symptoms become increase, increasingly uh, severe and include jaundice, the inflammation, and pan inflammation of pancreas and severe weight loss, shock, liver failure, massive hemorrhage, and multi organ uh, failure. The case fatality rate of Marburg hemorrhagic fever is between 25 to 80%. So you see the pic this picture, uh, this is the arm of the Marburg uh, virus patient. You see the many blister like injuries with the bleed. And on the center, so this is the hamster experimentally infected with the Marburg virus. And you see the many small red dots. Uh, this is uh, the hemorrhage uh, induced by the hem uh, Marburg virus infection. And inside its body, there are many uh, signs of the uh, hemorrhage. 
And in the progress of the infection, this kind of hemorrhage uh, will appear and uh, spread to the uh, other organs. And finally, the animals will be killed by the multi-organ failure. The first natural uh, outbreak of Marburg virus occurred in South Africa. So it was eight years later after the outbreak in Europe. Yeah. The small outbreaks occurred occasionally with several years intervals in the, mainly in South and Central, Afri Central Africa. Uh, there are two large outbreaks recorded in twice in 1998 or in uh, 2004 in Central, Central African countries. So as you see this table, very high fatality are recorded in each outbreaks. The Marburg is considered to spread between human to human by a body fluid such as blood. However, in many small outbreaks of Marburg, uh, for example, so in this case, only the three people are affected and seem not to spread. So it means that maybe the ability of the, uh, the natural Marburg virus between humans are usually not high. Uh, but sometimes the uh, high pathogenic uh, strain emerge uh, from the in the inside the bat and spread to the humans and cause the human to human uh, spread and uh, resulted in the large outbreak. Okay, so the first outbreak uh, of the Marburg in uh, Germany was clearly caused by the contact to the African green monkey. So just uh, firstly, researchers think that uh, the, uh, the monkeys and primates are the natural host. But after the lot of effort of the, uh, the seeking the natural reservoir in the wildlife, the Marburg virus genome, uh, the anti-Marburg virus antibody was detected from the specific bat uh, named of the Rhodetus aegyptix. The, its common name is Egyptian fruit bat. And finally, the infectious Marburg virus was isolated from the same bat in, in Uganda. And more importantly, the subsequent uh, experiment infection was uh, conducted. And the Marburg infection in Egyptian, Egyptian fruit bat revealed that the virus develop, uh, did not develop any manifestations. So it means that this Egyptian fruit bat are tolerant to this deadly Marburg virus. Now, so it is widely accepted that the Egyptian fruit bat is a natural host of Marburg virus. So, okay. So now the story of the Ebola virus. The Ebola virus is the biologically very close to Marburg virus, but uh, the risk of the Ebola virus is quite higher than the Marburg virus. There are four hurricane uh, Ebola viruses are genetically uh, now, and they are genetically somewhat different, but each other were clo close each other. But in contrast, there are another the Ebola virus strain, Western Ebola viruses, found in the Philippines and China. Uh, this is genetically very apart from the, these African Ebola viruses, is and is now no pathogenic to the humans. And Ebola virus spread uh, easily between the human to human contact by a blood fluid, uh, by a blood body fluid or blood, and sometimes even a doctor can get infection from patient and die. So only the fully equipped fully equipped, well-trained person should be contact with the patient or a dead body as seen in this photo. You should not stand uh, close to the patient uh, without any equipped like this man. And this poster was made by the UNICEF and you can see, you may see in the African countries. And this is for warning the Ebola virus infection. So on the left, so you see the common sign of Ebola virus infection, such as chilling, the vomit and diarrhea coughing, but all of this, the RNA clinical signs are not specific to Ebola viruses. And the right hand side shows how Ebola virus uh, transmit to humans. For example, uh, this figure means that the transmission 
can occur uh, through the blood. And these pictures mean that the possibility of transmission from bat uh, and uh, primate, uh, also the fruit eaten by the wild animals uh, will become the source of the Ebola virus. So Ebola virus enters the patient through the mucous membranes and breaks in the skin and infect many cell types, including monocyte, macrophages, and dendritic cells, and endothelial cells. The incubation period may be related to the infection route. And it is uh, usually said that the incubation time, uh, for example, by the needle infection is six days uh, before the onset of illness. And for the human, human, uh, human to human contact, the incubation time to until the onset of illness is usually 10 days. The Ebola, virus, the Ebola virus migrate from the initial infection site to the regional lymph nodes and subsequently uh, reaches to the liver and the spleen. And Ebola virus appear to trigger the release of the pro-inflammatory cytokine kinds uh, with the sub subsequent vascular leak and the impairment of the clotting or coagulation system uh, induced by the increase of the pro-inflammatory cytokines resulting in the multi-organ failure and shock. And you should remember the blood coagulation system. I, I think you already run in the text book. The hemorrhage uh, caused by the Ebola virus infection is not resulted by the direct disruption of the blood endothelial cells by the virus infection, but rather caused by the disruption of the coagulation system uh, induced by the host reaction to the virus infection. So since the first outbreak uh, was recorded in the South Africa in 1976, the several outbreaks occurred in mainly in Central Africa until now. The size of the Ebola virus outbreaks were much larger than the Marburg virus. In 2014, so you may remember, this was the biggest outbreak occurred uh, in the human history. And if this was the, out, uh, the first outbreak occurred in the West Africa, yeah. So in this occasion, the many people are involved. And also the, well, the Ebola virus infected person was found in USA, UK and Spain, the first time Ebola virus out, uh, out of the African continent. Among the these many the death cases, the around the 10% are uh, the healthcare workers. So as the case of Marburg virus infection, so at first the primate and the monkeys were suspected as a candidate reservoir or for Ebola virus infection. So indeed, the outbreak of in the 1995 was believed to be the start with the contact to the dead non-human primate. However, it is well known that the Ebola virus infection in non-human primate are lethal meaning that the Ebola virus cannot be maintained in the primate and monkeys. So thus, as research, researchers thought, there were true natural hosts of Ebola virus. So during the outbreaks, it was known that many dead animals were found uh, around the outbreak area. So in, in the, actually, the Ebola virus genomes were detected from gorilla and chimpanzees at high rate uh, from these uh, dead animals. And the researchers concluded that the primates were killed by the Ebola virus infection. And so far, there have been many fatal cases of primate in Ebola virus infection. So it is well known that Ebola virus is uh, high pathogenic to primate as well as human. So further, the viral genome was detected also from uh, here, the duica. This is the African small deer. Uh, but the, the how, however, the pathogenicity or the role of these uh, animals other than the primate and monkeys are not established so far. So to examine the expand of Ebola virus infection in wildlife. A serological examination was conducted on wild monkeys and primates in different countries. 
the tests revealed that those monkeys and primates had substantial number of uh, Ebola virus antibody. So the results indicate that they had been infected and some of them are not uh, killed and survived and developed uh, Ebola virus antibodies. And the US CDC tries to uncover the natural host of Ebola virus by the different approach. So using the experimental infection strategy. So now uh, you have a lot of knowledge uh, that in this seminar, uh, of course, I started with the bat and viruses. But uh, you, uh, once you forget about the everything, forget about the every your knowledge, and now please imagine that now the unknown deadly virus is emerging suddenly and nobody knows that where uh, this virus came. So the CDC gathered the various living creatures, including plants, insects, birds, and reptiles, and incubate and inoculate the Ebola viruses. And after some you know, the few days, they examined the amplification of Ebola viruses in these experimental creatures. And this table shows the result of experimental infection uh, of Ebola virus in plant. They tested various plants, such as pumpkins and tomatoes and cottons and tobaccos, but no virus amplification, amplification was observed. So here is the data of experimental infection in vertebrate and in vertebrate. And this table is more important than the plant. So I, I hope so. I hope you see these small letters. Through the experiment, uh, experimental examination of, of various creatures, Ebola virus genome was detected only from the snake and a bat, mouse, and spiders. But in case of these sna uh, snakes and mouse and spiders, the, only the very small amount of virus was detected. So this is nearly the detection limit. So the researchers thought that uh, they detected only the left over of the inoculated virus. But in contrast, in this three back, uh, the relatively very high titers of the virus genome was detected. So indicating that the virus amplified in this bat. And more importantly, that this bat did not any clinical symptoms. So now the researchers began considering that bat, bat might be natural host of Ebola virus. So indeed, in the field of study, uh, it, is, it reveals that where the bat had anti Ebola virus antibody in a substantial rate. So these are the pictures of this bat. These are the African bat. And furthermore, the part of Ebola virus genome was detected from bat. However, the virus genome was detected only this single occasion, and the result was not confirmed in the subsequent many investigations until now. And despite the extensive efforts to find the uh, the evidence of Ebola virus infection in bat. The infectious Ebola virus has never been isolated from bat so far. That, thus, the associations between human Ebola virus and bat are uh, probably true, but the true contribution of bat uh, as a reservoir of Ebola virus natural host uh, needs further investigation. Here is a sequence comparison of Ebola virus genome detected from human, monkeys, and bat. This case is very different from the uh, COVID-19, but the Ebola virus genome from bat are quite uh, similar. They're almost identical to the human viruses. So this result indicates that substantially identical Ebola virus are circulating between uh, among human, bat, and um, animal populations, meaning it is possible that human got infection directly from bat in the outbreak in the past. But you must remember that this, uh, these seven RNA sequences, are only the very small portion of the Ebola virus genome. And this is the only 
uh, virus genome that uh, we uh, got so far. So in the words, in the other words, that we need other scientific evidence uh, for conclusion uh, uh, that Ebola virus from birth for uh, is uh, also the actually the same one to the human Ebola viruses. So the if but are the natural host of Ebola viruses, there are another problems about the virus transmission from bat to humans. So as well as the COVID-19 or the case of the Nipah viruses, in Ebola viruses, the other animals such as non-human primate or uh, the monkeys are suspected to the direct cause of the virus transmission from wildlife to humans because they, these animals are more close to humans than bat. But even if gorilla and chimpanzees are made it is a virus transmission from bat to human, so we must think how these animals get virus infection from bat. So this is the hypothesis how these terrestrial animals working on the ground get Ebola virus infection from the flying bat. So usually bat and primates live separately without any contact especially in the wet season. Oops. Wet season. That at, the, at, this, at this condition, the lot of fruit are available around, so they are the distribution of these animals are dispersed. But in dry season, animals gather to the limited area of water uh, where the terrestrial animals and but get closer contact. So in this condition, terrestrial Terrestrial animals may contact the bat feces or bat urine or the fruit eaten by bat. And during that activities, these animals will get the chance to the viruses from bat. So we, mo we will move on to the final topic. Uh, how can bat tolerate these bat, uh, these high pathogenic viruses? So again, we back to this, right? So as I shown until here, the many viruses of high mortality are associated with bad. Then everyone will have same question. So why bad? Since the discovery of the association between the bat and Ebola viruses or in bat with SARS and Nipah viruses, the researchers began the molecular studies regarding how bat accept pathogenic viruses infection without symptoms. However, there was a bit problem to perform the experiment using bat. So as you know, the many animals are used for laboratory experiments, but the feasibility of experiments varied considerably, considerably based on the animal species. For, for example, so you like to use uh, uh, the mouse or sometimes use the frogs uh, due to, uh, because they are very easy to handle and they do not require the large cage can feed artificial food and can buy, uh, can keep in a small cage with a many liter size, many liter size. But uh, if, you, if we, we think about the study of the humans, Apparently, monkeys is the best animal model. But however, due to the hundreds of reasons uh, using the, uh, uh, the monkey as an infection model, such as the high cost and time and the problem of the ethics, uh, the mouse rather than the monkeys uh, is favorable. And but, the bat is small, but uh, it may be more difficult uh, than monkeys. So as I introduced in the beginning of this seminar, bat are the only flying mammals and can disseminate the pathogens around. And this flying ability and dissemination of the pathogens around is not welcomed in the settings of the experimental infection, especially for using the pathogenic uh, viruses. But alternatively, researchers use the cell lines that are established from bat for the study of the biological characters. 
And this slide summarizes the general reaction of the immunity and inflammation during virus infection in the, the, the common mammalian species. In the left-hand side, uh, it depicts the innate immunity reaction. So this is the cell. So uh, inside the virus infected cell, the virus component such as the virus genome is recognized by the pattern, so-called the pattern recognition receptors, including LIGOI, MDA5, TLR, and CGAS. And this, the molecular signals induced uh, the activation of the sting or the activation of the interferon expression. And finally, the interferon stimulated gene uh, expressed and they work to suppress the virus infection. And on the right hand side, the inflammatory responses in the body are shown. The virus infected cells were the blood monocyte, uh, which detect the virus infection in the body, produced uh, the pro-inflammatory pro pro cytokines, including IL-1, IL-6, interferon gamma, and TNF alpha. And the expression of these pro-inflammatory cytokines induce the local or systemic inflammation and contribute to, uh, to the suppress the virus infection. But this inflammation always accompanied with the clinical symptoms such as the pain, fever, or redness. So this inflammation is well regulated by the anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as the interleukin 10 or TGF beta. And these anti-inflammation uh, cytokines work to not to cause the overexpression of the, the these inflammation cytokines. So in the regular time course of infection, the induction of inflammatory cytokines occurs. Firstly, here, as shown in the green line, the inflammation contributes to, to the removal of virus infection. But this inflammation uh, induces the clinical manifestations such as pain, heat, redness, swelling, and loss of function. So after the induction of the, these anti-inflammatory cytokines, this uh, reaction is regulated by and suppressed by the induction, uh, the anti-inflammatory cytokines uh, induced after the, the invoke of the uh, inflammatory reactions. So this is the regular reaction. But in subabnormal condition, uh, such as the infection of the specialty viruses, the inflammation continues and clinical manifestations become worse. This uh, the condition is called a cytokine storm. And in the, in the condition of the cytokine storm, the more severe uh, the manifestation occurs, such as including the ARAS or DIC or shock or the multiple organ failure. And it, it is considered that the cytokine storm can happen when the induction of the, this, the anti-inflammatory cytokines are disrupted by the infections of some special viruses. For example, uh, the COVID-19 or the H5N1 avian influenza viruses are known to uh, induce this cytokine storm. This the slide shows an example of the multi-level mechanisms of the dampened inflammasome activation in back. So in the left hand side, it is the, the common reaction uh, we run in the text book. So in human or mice, for example, after the infection pathogen, the pattern recognition receptor activation by viral component or viral double-stranded strand RNA activates the, the NLRP3. This is the, component, uh, the factor of the inflammasome while well, another protein, the AIM2 inflammasome reaction. And then these uh, reactions are formed the uh, intact ASC formation and uh, induced activation of CASPAD1. And activated CASPAD1 induced the cleavage of in, uh, the immature in, uh, IL1 beta and induced the mature IL1 beta secretion. And also the CASPAD1 induced the pyroptosis. This is the program of the cell death. 
Now, after the cell death, the virus uh, cannot uh, amplify it uh, more, uh, after anymore. But in bat cells, this, uh, the, uh, the normal inflammatory reactions did not, do not occur. The, the inflammatory, uh, the key proteins of the NLRP3 AIM2 is uh, less functional in the bat cells and causing the reduced reaction, uh, reduced activation of the Caspar one or less uh, activation of the interferon beta or not, do not cause the paraptosis. So it is considered that the bat have an excellent balance between the enhanced host defense and the immune tolerance. Uh, so this is the uh, example of the enhanced uh, host defense includes the constitution, constitutive expression of interference or the constitutive expression of interference stimulated genes and increased expression of heat shock protein and enhanced autophagy. All these enhanced reactions of innate immunity response contribute to the suppress the over amplification of virus in bad body. And on the other, other hand, on the left hand side, the dysfunction of inflammatory reaction pathways of in bat or now, because the dampened function of NLRP3 or AMM2 or IL1 beta and sting are constant, considered to key factor for uh, making the tolerance of bats to pathogenic viruses. So this is just a hypothesis, but uh, Evidences supporting this idea have been accumulated in the recent uh, some years, and the current occurrence of the COVID-19 accelerate the study uh, of the molecular mechanisms, how but can tolerate to the deadly viruses. Okay, so this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryuta Um, So now we're entering the first discussion. If anyone has a questions or anything to ask, please ask through the chat box or you can raise your hand. Okay, I will read um, the first questions from Dr. Mufasirin. The, there are two Two questions, Dr. Yuta. Uh, yes. Do you want to write it down first, or you want to answer one by one? Yeah. Uh, so you mean description describe it in the chat? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, okay. So, in the first, uh, there are two questions. The first one is: How long does it take for such shear with true from animals to stable? Sensible to in humans. So probably, uh, I think that nobody now has the correct answer. But in my experience, it takes at least uh, so usually hundred years, maybe. But so if the uh, the uh, but uh, still have the. Uh, you know, the human, well, human adapted viruses in nature, it may uh, be more shorter years, but I, I think it at least takes the few years. So I don't think, but uh, I don't think that the human gets the viruses uh, at the exact time of the end of the 2019, but I guess uh, human got the viruses uh, without notice uh, for the many years, uh, long time ago, without notice in China, or maybe somewhere outside of China. So the another question is, uh, just a moment, ah, okay. The pattern of similarity of SARS-CoV-2 nucleotide sequence in bat, is it possible that SARS-CoV-2 infect human uh, not from bat? Is it the result of uh, genetic engineering? <laughs> okay, so you mean about the... Okay, uh, just a moment. So we're back to the slide of the genetic similarity. 
Okay, so there are many, you know, the experimental infection of the COVID-19 to the human. Uh, no, there's no, no experimental infection human, but uh, there are many experimental infection of human virus to the bat. Yes, it is possible, but the efficiency of the infectivity of the human virus to bat is not quite good. Then there is a vice versa. The bat virus is not well uh, amplified in the human cells or uh, yeah, human cells. But the current, so the currently the human, the, the virus from the human and virus from bat is biologically clearly different. So, uh, yes, the, the another question that uh, it is the result of the genetic engineering. Yes, uh, no, no, uh, so nobody knew the answer, but is it possible or uh, because, uh, you know, uh, for example, there is a, you know, the, the many, the single uh, nucleotide mutation, these spontaneous single nucleotide mutations easily occur during the passage in the cells or in the passage in the natural host. But the, there is a, for example, the three uh, the nucleotide deletion from the pangolin to humans. This kind of deletion was, uh, so I, I didn't show in this seminar, but uh, there is a, it is now that uh, there is a uh, six, uh, six nucleotide insertion additional insertion in the human viruses, it was not found in the bat. This kind of the deletion, large deletion or new, uh, insertion should not occur easily. So that uh, such kind of the, you know, the human may, uh, human made that, that, that kind of uh, mutant viruses uh, made in China, somewhere in China for the army, uh, purposes, but uh, the answer is, but uh, now in, in nobody knew. Only the, if somebody make this virus, only that person can know the answer. Probably we will not know in the future, never. Okay, so we will all move to the next question. So where is the question? Yes, uh, do you want me to read the questions for you? Yes. Uh, uh, the second the second question is uh, from Bernadette. Good morning, yeah. Dr. Yuta Karnai. I would like to ask some questions. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. What the born virus should we uh, look yeah. for? Yes. Okay. Uh, so so I, I read the question. So good morning, Dr. Yuta Karnai. I would like to ask some questions. So thank you very much. So what bat bone virus should we look out for? Which virus might re-emerge and cause another pandemic? What can we do to detect and prevent it? Thank you. So uh, what virus is, but uh, uh, there is no scientific reason, but in our experiments, probably, so, oh, oh, sorry. So as I showed in this slide, the emergent viruses was clustered in these three groups. So we don't know why these three viruses uh, cause repeatedly in humans, but probably uh, we can guess that uh, these viruses can have the, you know, the ability to adapt to the many host species. For example, the some virus species such as the HIV. HIV is a very host specific viruses the human virus can only infect the humans and simian HIV can only to uh, monkeys, monkeys. But probably these viruses may have the wider uh, cell, uh, host tropical uh, at the natural condition. So probably, so we should notice about the, the, these coronaviruses and filoviruses and the Hennepin viruses. Uh, in the detected in bat. And as I shown in the circular graph, where, yes, here, the, so far the many coronaviruses, this is the number of the virus genome sequences detected from bat. And uh, it was known that many of them 
uh, not related to the human pathogens. But once, uh, one method, the strategy is that we can detect uh, the isolated the infectious the coronaviruses from bat and then test infect to the human cells. Then if that virus can amplify well, so it may be the, the possible, the, the candidate for the next the emergence virus. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there are another questions. Yes, we are. Okay. Um, from Ramadanti. I have ah, okay, a question okay. about the ah, okay, okay. Yeah. okay, I found it. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Yuta. So thank you very much, Ramadanti. So I have a question about the bat. So which carry a lot of viruses? As we know, there are a few species of bat around the world. Is there any bat species which are more prone to carry virus than others? Uh, uh, so far, so far. So as I shown in this graph, there are many bat species around the world and uh, over the 1,000 species, bat species are now. And for example, that in Japan, uh, in Japan, so we have only the small bat uh, distributed in Japan. So we don't have any flying fox. So I was very surprised to see the large fox uh, hanging on the tree in Indonesia. And so far, so nobody, uh, nobody had the scientific evidence, but uh, the many the deadly viruses are found from the large flying fox distributed in the, uh, the tropical uh, areas in Africa and the South East, uh, Southeast Asian uh, two areas. So probably we should notice that the kind of the Pteropsus, uh, genus Pteropsus large, uh, the flying fox. And uh, it, uh, okay, so this is, that's my answer. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. So is the the is this another yes, question? There's another Lisa? last questions from Rizal, yes. Okay, so thank you, Rizal. So okay, so as far as I know that Indonesia has no many of human was infected by Nipah or Hendra virus like that happened in the neighborhood country, but there is research found that but in many places in Indonesia, such as Medan, Sumatra, and Kalimantan has antibody of these viruses. So what the reason of these viruses not that infect Indonesian people? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Riza. So I think that uh, Nipah virus is uh, the naturally the bat viruses. And very, very accidentally, so sometimes it's very rare, occasion, uh, the, the specific uh, viruses evolved naturally in the bat that can infect human or pigs. And that caused the accident that infect to the human or pigs. But uh, uh, as I show in the graph in the early outbreak in the Malaysia, in Nipah viruses, this is the case of the outbreak, small outbreaks in the Perak outbreaks. Yeah. Oop. In these outbreaks, only the few cases of the people are sporadically in uh, you know the different time. So, so, so to tell the truth, these uh, patients were found later after the outbreak of these viruses. This is the uh, uh, so, so when the onset of these outbreaks, nobody knew this is the cause of the Nipah viruses. So it may be the same uh, same things that will be happen in the Indonesia that somebody gets virus infection and showed only the right manifestation and uh, cured without the notice of the Nipah viruses. And I'm very interested in the zero epidemiology among the humans, especially in the healthy people. And I think maybe the substantial people may get the antibody. So the, it, it means the history of the Nipah virus infection. 
So I'm interested in, also interested in the infection rate in Indonesia. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, there's another question, doctor. Yes. Doctor. Okay, so another question. So thank you, Mushamado. The, the question is the potential Ebola virus as a pathogenic agent. Is there any possibility to be pandemic like COVID-19 according to your analysis because the human mobility promotes potential area to another place? Yes, it is very possible. So actually, as I shown in the graph, in the, in the largest outbreak in 2014, so I remember very well about this incident. In that case, uh, the outbreak spread very rapidly uh, from the center of the outbreak to the neighboring countries. And uh, the patient was found outside the outcome outside the African continent in USA and Spain and UK. And the Ebola virus is known to spread easily uh, by the contact of, uh, of the human to human. And doctors in the Africa can get easily the infection from the patient. So in this case, uh, it was very uh, so anxious, the, uh, the Ebola virus spread worldwide, but uh, did not. So I, I, I don't know why this virus did not uh, cause the uh, world, worldwide pandemic. But in the future, uh, the, if the more the pathogenic virus, Ebola virus can uh, if emerge, it may spread and kill many people worldwide outside Africa. Yeah, so it is very possible. We, so we must notice more uh, carefully. Thank you very much. So there's another question. So uh, thank you, Anastasia. So I would like to ask you a question regarding on how is the best and safest way to collect the bat sample from the field according to your experience? Because as we know that catching the bat is very hard. Thank you. The safest way is uh, very laborious, so you, I think we you were at this kind of laboratory cross in the hot tropical jungle. And, but still you should not touch. Uh, if you are a student, you should not touch the animals directly, but you probably you get uh, the contact to the bat feces in the cave, for example, caves with the pincet to the, uh, but feces on correct on the tubes and back to the laboratory and uh, laboratory of the high safe facility. Like uh, I think you have the very uh, uh, good uh, laboratory facility for influenza viruses that the BSL three level. So this is the most you know, proper way, but uh, it is very laborious, may harder to collect the many, uh, to handle the many uh, samples at the same time. Okay, thank you very much, Anastasia. Okay. Okay, I think um, there are no more questions. Before we uh, go into the second session, I would like to ask for the last question, Dr. Kane, is it? Yes. Okay, um, I would like to ask that you said that SARS-CoV-2 has a correlations with the bat virus, yeah. with, uh, with the human virus. And based on the three phylogenic analyses, there's a mm -hmm. partial sequences that are originating from humans and similar into the origin of the bat virus. Yeah. And do you think it is possible to make vaccine recombinant from the bat antigen uh, for this COVID-19 pandemic or maybe the antibody another therapy for this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, it is possible. So they actually, this virus is very close and uh, it is known that the antigenicity of the human and bat viruses are closely active. So if we prepare the, the vaccine, so using the bat viruses or the current COVID-19, so it can be the partially uh, effective to the, the future novel coronaviruses. Yeah, it is possible. Thank you very much. 
Okay, I think there there is one more questions from Dr. Muhammad Yunus. Muhammad. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. So uh, the another question. So thank you, Muhammad. The currently, what kind of effort to prevent the possibility to be pandemic by WHO or other energy or at health? So I don't think that WHO or the other uh, uh, the energy groups do not any prevention strategy to the future pandemic, but the, only the, the researchers in the uh, university to find, try to find the novel viruses for future pandemic. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, is there any more questions before we move on into the second session? Okay, no questions. Maybe uh, next, we will entering the second session to Dr. Yutakane, the time is yours. Oh, okay. So can I take a five minute break? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's possible. Okay. Five minutes. Okay, so let's take a, a break. So I'm we'll be back in five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so everyone, uh, you can take five minutes and please fill the Google form in the chat box for certificate. It will be another second session in five minutes. Thank you. Selamat datang di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga lahir sejak tahun 1972 silam yang berdiri dengan semangat tinggi melahirkan generasi bangsa hebat dalam dunia perkembangan pendidikan kedokteran hewan di Indonesia. Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga diarahkan pada pendidikan dokter hewan yang general professional qualification di lapangan yang menguasai bidang kesehatan hewan, produksi ternak, dan kesehatan masyarakat veteriner. FKH mempunyai beberapa program studi, yaitu program sarjana kedokteran hewan, program pendidikan profesi dokter hewan, dan beberapa program studi S2, yaitu Magister Biologi Reproduksi, Magister Ilmu Penyakit dan Kesehatan Masyarakat Veteriner, Magister Agribisnis Veteriner, Magister Ilmu Vaksinologi dan Imunoterapeutika, dan program studi doktoral Sains Veteriner. FKH juga mempunyai satu program studi kedokteran hewan berada di Banyuwangi, yaitu kita sebut dengan PSDKU Banyuwangi. FKH mempunyai 30 guru besar yang mempunyai kompetensi yang sesuai di bidangnya. FKH mempunyai kelas internasional, akreditasi internasional, dan mempunyai mahasiswa yang mendapatkan beasiswa Erlangga Development Scholarship untuk program studi S2 dan program studi doktoral. Para dosen mempunyai kontribusi besar dalam menghasilkan publikasi skopus, 
riset collaboration dengan beberapa dosen baik perguruan tinggi di dalam dan tentunya uh, para dosen yang berada di luar negeri dan para dosen menghasilkan beberapa paten yang sangat membanggakan dan tentunya ini akan memberikan profil FKH ke depan menjadi lebih bagus lagi dan tentunya akan menuju kepada Universitas Erlangga yang hebat Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan menjadi fakultas pilihan di mana dengan berbagai macam fasilitas yang representatif. Berbagai macam fasilitas ini menjadikan mahasiswa belajar lebih nyaman dan semangat. Keberadaan sarana ini mendukung proses pendidikan secara maksimal dan memberikan ruang eksplorasi kepada dunia kedokteran hewan yang lebih luas. Keberadaan alumni menjadi citra perguruan tinggi dalam keberhasilannya mencetak generasi hebat dalam dunia kerja. Saya ingin menjadi bagian di antaranya dengan memberikan impact positif terhadap reputasi fakultas maupun universitas dalam membangun jaringan yang lebih luas. Bagi saya, menempuh pendidikan di FKH UNER ini memberikan kesempatan dan keahlian sehingga saya dan mahasiswa lainnya juga bisa mengakses peluang dalam meningkatkan karir dan profesionalisme. Satu tempat di mana kita bisa belajar lebih adalah keberadaan Rumah Sakit Hewan Pendidikan Universitas Erlangga. Sebagai tempat magang dan praktik mahasiswa, baik S1 maupun profesi, bahkan S2 dan S3 dalam pelaksanaan riset. Sebagai contoh kolaborasi riset di bidang kedokteran dan juga melayani untuk masyarakat umum. Dengan tenaga dokter hewan dan dan para medis yang berpengalaman di bawah bimbingan para guru besar yang ada, gedung RSAP UNER menjadi salah satu gedung RSAP terbesar di Indonesia. RSAP UNER hadir dengan beragam alat pendukung berteknologi tinggi dalam memberikan hasil maksimal dan proses pendidikan dan pelayanan. Prestasi tertinggimu melalui belajar dengan kurikulum yang berkualitas dan terukur. Kegiatan organisasi mahasiswa yang menarik dan bimbingan dari para alumni yang sukses di Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Erlangga. Dengan kerja keras, semangat, kami siapkan fasilitas, dosen, dan tenaga kependidikan serta atmosfer keilmuan kampus yang berkualitas sesuai dengan kebutuhan Anda dan kita semua. Nikmati segala kemudahan proses belajar Anda melalui kerjasama nasional dan internasional yang telah kami bangun. Bersama Fakultas Kedokteran Hewan Universitas Air Langga, Ibu no kering, no apa Kuat aja. Tapi kita siap, oke? Okay. Hey Dr. Yuta, can I are you? Yes. Yeah, I'm ready. Are you ready for the second session? Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, uh, we will begin the second session now. The time is yours. Okay. So. Okay, so do you see my presentation? So. Okay, so let me start the second half of the session. So on the, on the latter half of this seminar, I'm going to introduce my own research on Nelson Bay real virus, which is a bat bone virus and, and also the rotavirus. virus. Rota virus is an enteric virus causing the severe diarrhea in human children and young animals. The rotavirus is not related to bat, but uh, the progress of my rotavirus research have been closely supported by the study of the Nelson Bay Oreo virus. Okay, uh, so the both the uh, rotavirus and Nelson Bay Oreo virus belong to the family Leo viride. So Leo means uh, the respiratory enteric orphan virus. The viruses of the family Leoviri, they are known enveloped viruses. The virion contains uh, 19, uh, 10 to the 12 segmented double strand RNA genome. The type species is a mammalian Leovirus. This is a common human pathogen, uh, human virus, but without uh, very less pathogenic viruses. So if you purify the virus genome and subject it to the gel electrophoresis, you see the 10 uh, individual bands of the virus gene segment. And during the virus replication step, uh, the single stranded um, RNA, this is a, a function of the messenger RNA, uh, synthesized and the virus protein are translated. The family really contains several important human and animal pathogens. The mammalian leovirus has 10 gene segment this is a common human pathogen causing only an asymptomatic in respiratory symptom. This virus, but the can selectively infect cancers. So this virus is being developed as an oncolit oncolytic viruses. The second, the Nelson Bayer virus is a bat bone zoonotic virus is causing severe respiratory infection. The rotavirus has an 11 gene segment and causes severe diarrhea in human and animals. So either of these viruses are scientifically very interesting for me. So we are now studying those viruses for different purposes. So let's begin with the story of rotavirus. So rotavirus is a non-enveloped virus with 11 gene segment of double-stranded RNA genome. The rotavirus infection causes severe gastroenteritis in human infants uh, less than five years old, or also in the young animals. Rotavirus infections are found worldwide, but rotavirus related deaths is con uh, concentrated in Africa and South Asia. So uh, annually, the, uh, approximately 150,000 deaths are recorded. And more importantly to me is that the reverse genetic system, uh, that is a technique for gene manipulation of the virus is, was not established when I started the rotavirus study in 2012. The term, the reverse genetics uh, is defined to indicate the technology to generate the virus artificially from the purified DNA or RNA. For example, so you purify the viral RNA genome from the infectious virus, and then this gene is cloned into the plasmid. And if you transfect this uh, plasmid into the cells, then finally you get infectious virus. The important thing of this technology is that you cannot change or manipulate the virus gene of infectious viruses. But once you clone the virus gene into the plasmid, you can manipulate the virus genes as you like by PCR technique and can generate the gene engineered viruses. 
So the reverse cinetics is a strong tool, and now the mandatory technique to the study of the molecular biology of the viruses. Thus, the reverse cinetics for the human important viruses, including the polio viruses, rabies, and the influenza viruses, have been established one by one the before the 2000. However, for the family Leogiride, we had to wait until the 2007. So this is the first reverse genetics of the family Leogiride uh, reported in the 2007. This is uh, reverse genetics of the mammalian rare virus. This is the human rare virus. So in this system, the virus genes are firstly cloned and into the plasm plasmid. At the five prime end, the T7 promoter is placed, and at the three prime end, uh, this the ribozyme sequence of uh, derived from the hepatitis delta virus was placed here. And if uh, to when you uh, transfect these 10, 11 plasmid into the cells, the virus gene is expressed at the very exact position of the five prime end and the three prime end is cleaved uh, exactly by the function of the ribosome and the virus genes uh, expressed, virus, the virus protein that translated and finally the progeny virus is synthesized. So this is the basic system of the reverse genetics of the family Reoberide. But so you remember that the mammalian rare virus is a human pathogen, but less pathogenic, indicating that the mammalian rare virus is, this virus is not important pathogen for human virus. The, among the family Leoviride, so rotavirus is uh, uh, definitely the most important virus uh, for humans and animals. Thus, uh, many researchers including us tries to establish the liver synthetics for the rotaviruses. And also, we also do uh, just to follow the mammalian rare virus system. So we clone the virus uh, 11 uh, gene of the rotavirus uh, cloned into the plasmid and transfect this 11 plasmid into the cells and wait. But after the repeated uh, experiment, uh, we have never get the infectious virus. So then we stopped this uh, experiment for a while. Then along with the rotavirus, I was working with the study of the Nelson Bell rotavirus. This is a high pathogenic bat-borne rotavirus. This Nelson Bell rotavirus was firstly recorded from an Australian bat in 1968. So the virus was uh, believed for a long time as the bat's fifth but specific virus. So I call this virus as a Nelson Bayer virus or simply NVV hereafter. The second case of the NVV was uh, detected from the Malaysian bat. Uh, this is the 30 years later after the first discovery. But in 2006, this virus was isolated from the Malaysian patient here uh, who showed the severe respiratory symptoms. And after the first human case, this virus was detected from human and bat in Southeastern Asian countries. Now, the Nelson Bell virus is considered as a high pathogenic bat human pathogen. And so here is the one Japanese patient. So this is the imported, imported case from the Indonesia. This Japanese patient uh, stayed in Bali, Indonesia uh, for some while and get the slight fever uh, two days before uh, back to Japan. And after back to Japan, this patient showed the high fever and the symptoms got worse with respiratory, resp respiratory symptoms. Uh, the specific viral examination for non viruses, including influenza, para influenza, herpes, mumps, and coronaviruses are all negative. But finally, the rapid determination system, for, which is a non specific detection system of the virus genome, and the researchers found the genome sequence of the Nelson Bell virus. And this graph shows the positive rate of uh, NVV specific antibody in healthy donors in Malaysia. 
So you see the, the as high as 12.8 percent have anti-NBV antibodies. This result, result su suggested that those people have a history of NBV infection in the past, so probably without recognized. Similarly, the cell epidemiological study in the Vietnam and this is the result in Vietnam and the PCR test in the Malaysia also detected detected substantial number of NBV positive uh, evidence in the people uh, in the people because the serological test and the PCR test may produce sometimes non-specific reactions. The data must be confirmed again and again before conclusion. But if this data is correct, uh, the NBV may be spread more than we have thought as a common cause of respiratory virus infections. And this slide summarizes the symptom, uh, sim symptoms of seven, uh, seven NBV patients recorded so far. So please remember, remember that all the seven patients uh, were hospitalized by the severe symptoms. The major symptoms are high fever, and uh, uh, upper respiratory symptoms. And you also notice that the three of seven showed the symptoms related to the intestinal organs. Based on these symptoms, we can speculate that NBV can uh, infect both respiratory and intestinal organs. So for studying the molecular mechanisms of the high pathogenicity of NBV, so I attempted to establish the mouse infection model. So at first I prepared the four different strains of experimental mouse and I inoculated uh, Nelson Barrier virus intranasal route to these to mice. This above graph shows the kinetics of the body weight. So you see the reduction of the body weight of only the this C3H mice, this is the this brown mice. The lower graph is the survival curve. All the C3H mice were killed until the 10 days post infection. The result clearly demonstrated that this C3H mice is uh, the most sensitive to NBV infection than other mouse strains. Thus, this C3H mice were used in the later experiment. So using this mouse infection model, so firstly, I tested the different route of virus inoculation. When the, uh, this, uh, the virus was inoculated by an uh, intranasal route, the majority of infectious viruses are recovered from trachea and lung after the two, four, and six days post infection. The animals demonstrated body weight reduction as shown in this graph and were killed until 10 days. The lungs of the infected mice were bleed, yeah? And as shown in the, this uh, histological section, HG scanning, the structure of the tissues of normal lung were completely disrupted. The virus infected cells were shown in the brown by the immunostaining. You see the virus infection in the cells of trachea on the, or the lung cells around here. But on the other hand, the mice that inoculated orally uh, with the NBV uh, did not develop any symptoms. There was no body weight reduction and only the very small amount of viruses were, viruses were detected uh, from the intestine, but uh, I was not sure if this is the result of the virus replication or just uh, I detect the leftover of the inoculated virus. So this result verify that uh, NBV is a respiratory infectious virus. So pro probably the human could get also uh, could get the NBV infection by uh, aerosol. And Nelson Barrier virus has a unique uh, characters in comparison to the other uh, virus members of the family Leoviridae. So this is the phylogenetic tree of the family Leoviridae. So here is the rotaviruses, and here is the mammalian rheoviruses, and the uh, Nelson B. virus is here. So these two viruses are very close. And the Nelson B. virus and uh, some members of the aqua virus, this is the fish rheoviruses. 
these some uh, members of the small groups cluster as the fusogenic real virus groups. So please remember that the rotavirus and mammalian real virus is not included in the fusogenic real virus. The common feature of the, these fusogenic real viruses is that these fusogenic real viruses has the fusion associated small transmembrane protein, so called fast protein. The, during the replication of the virus, this fast protein expressed and located on the cellular membrane and the presence as a transmembrane protein. So this movie uh, shows the time lapse uh, movie after the infection of the Nelson Bionroy virus. As you see, the infection of the fusogenic real virus, or just the overexpression of the, this fast protein in the cells, uh, it induces the cell to cell fusion, as you see this movie. This is a short time movie, just you see the change of the cell morphology within 12 hours. So finally, the all of the cells uh, make a large a single uh, sense tune and all cells are died. And this kind of fusion peptide is common in enveloped viruses. So again, so we run about the uh, basic biology. Um, probably you run before in the textbook. So this slide depicts the differences in the enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. The enveloped viruses, such as the influenza, HIV, and coronaviruses, is coated by the cellular membrane when they when this particle is uh, released. This outer membrane is called envelope. But in contrast, uh, the non-enveloped viruses, including the real virus and adenoviruses, do not wear the envelope. This is a naked uh, video. So please re remember the differ different morphology of the envelope and non enveloped viruses. So the, when the enveloped viruses enter into the cells, the fusion peptide uh, here, the fusion peptide which has the enveloped viruses mediate the, cell, uh, the fusion between the viral envelope and the cellular plasma membrane and uh, the viral capsule protein can enter into the cell. So this, the fu uh, fusion step uh, with the envelope and cellular membrane is required step for the enveloped viruses. So this kind of fusion peptide is mandatory and common in the enveloped viruses. But in non-enveloped viruses, including the real viruses, this kind of fusion step is not required. So Usually, so these non-enveloped viruses do not encode this kind of fusion peptide. So that's the first protein is the only example of the fusogenic protein uh, found among the non-enveloped viruses. So it is uh, very interesting, but the role of the fusion protein of the fusogenic real viruses remained undefined. So I've got very interesting why this virus, this kind of peculiar, unique fusion protein. Then to examine the biological role of fast proteins. So firstly, I established the reverse genetics of Nelson Bell real virus. This protocol was just the follow the uh, system for the mammalian real virus. So we cloned that we purified the viral gene from infectious virus and uh, each gene is cloned in the plasmid and total 11, uh, no, 10 plasmid are transfected into the cells. And finally, I got the recombinant virus. So using this system, I tried to rescue the fast gene knockout virus. The fast gene uh, located in the S1 gene segment of the Nelson Bell virus. So to abolish the expression of the fast protein, the ATG start codon was uh, replaced uh, to ACT. Then I used this mutant S1 gene, then combined with the other nine wild type gene, then transfect these 10 genes into the cells, and I got the virus. So this is these are the plugs made by the infectious viruses. Uh, 
the once the virus uh, replicate in the cells, the virus infection disrupt the cells and virus spread the neighboring cells, and this uh, hole uh, become large. So it indicated that uh, even a fast uh, protein knockout, the virus can still replicate. So it means the fast protein was not essential for the virus replication. But soon I found that the replication of the fast knockout virus was severely impaired in comparison to the wild type Nelson Biore virus. There was approximately 10 fold reduction of the viral replication by knocking out of the fast protein. The result clearly indicated that the fast protein was not essential for viral replication, but could uh, enhance the uh, replication of the Nelson Biore virus, at least in vivo, uh, no, no, at least in vitro. Then I examined the contribution of the fast protein in vivo. So using the lethal mouse model, the pathogenicity of the fast knockout virus was examined. The result was clear. While the wild type Nelson Biore virus infection killed the mice the before 10 days, the mice infected with the fast knockout virus survived completely. There was no body weight reaction in the mice with the fast knockout virus here. The, here is the body weight reduction of the infection, the wild type virus. And the lungs was very clear, no sign of the illness. And in the end, the, I found fast knockout virus is not amplified at all in the lungs of the mice. So this result in the mice model clearly indicates that the fast protein contributed to the uh, Nelson Bay virus high pathogenicity in mice and probably in human. Then I used this fast knockout virus for attenuated vaccine strain. The fast knockout uh, Nelson Bay virus were intranasally inoculated mice once or twice as a immunization here. Then the world type Nelson B. virus was infected. But, uh, this is a challenge infection. The control mice, the immunized only by the PBS, were killed after the world type virus infection. But the immunized uh, mice by the fast knockout virus survived uh, even after the virus challenge. So I don't think that this attenuated Nelson B. virus strain is uh, now. Uh, required for the regular vaccine, uh, regular vaccine in the Southeast Asian countries because the NBV infection is very rare case. But in the future, if the outbreak happen in, by the novel Nelson Nelson virus species, I think this fast knocking out of strategy to make the attenuated virus can be used to prepare the emergency vaccine virus. Then, so I uh, try to examine the relationship between the fast protein and the replication. So I have generated fast mu uh, protein mutant viruses with single amino acid mutations. So you remember that fast protein induces cell to cell fusion, yeah? Uh, These brown cells indicating the virus infected cells are stained by the immunostaining. The wild type virus infection induces large cell to cell fusion. But in contrast, the mutant viruses with the ninth barring uh, changed to arginine. Uh, here is a virus infected cell, but no sign of the cell to cell fusion occurred, indicating that uh, the mutation of the ninth barring to arginine abolished the function of the fast protein completely. And uh, on the Right one, this virus has stop codon at the 80, 85 varying position, induces the moderate cell to cell fusion. Then I made a series of these kind of the fast mutant viruses and the upper graph. This graph shows the number of the cells involved in the cell to cell fusion caused by the each mutant viruses. For example, the wild type virus infection. Uh, make a large uh, cell to cell fusion involving around 50 cells. And in the bottom cells, this graph shows the replication of these viruses. 
So you see that there is very correlation between the viral replication and the ability of the cell to cell fusion. So here is a summarized graph. So as you see, there, there is a linear correlation between the size of the cell to cell fusion and virus replication. So it uh, verifies the previous results that the cell to cell fusion uh, by the fast protein enhances the virus replication. Then I examined the detailed uh, time course of the cell to cell fusion and the viral replication. So after the infection of the world type Nelson Bialoya virus, the first sign of the cell to cell fusion occur at five to uh, at four to five hours post infection. The viral genome synthesis of the viral type virus, as shown in this graph, increased suddenly. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, yes. So this is the graph of the virus genome. So after the occurrence of the cell to cell fusion, at the five to six hours, there is a sudden increase of the virus genome. And after the increase of the virus genome, there was a production, increase of the production of the infectious virus in case of the world type virus infection. But in contrast, in the infection of the fast protein knockout viruses, this kind of steep increase was not uh, observed both in the virus genome in the, in the virus uh, production of the progeny viruses. Then I examined if the cell to cell fusion recover the replication of the fast knockout virus. Then, so I prepared the cells and the cells are transfected with the fast, uh, recombinant fast protein expression vector here and induce the artificial cell to cell fusion. And after that, the fast, uh, the fast protein knockout virus was infected. So at first uh, in this graph, please see the line and the white bars. This is, these are the replication of the fast, uh, uh, I'm sorry. So this is the replication of the wild type virus. And this is the replication of the fast knockout virus without uh, fast protein overexpression. But the overexpression of the recombinant fast protein uh, recovers the virus replication uh, to the level uh, nearly to the world type virus infection. Then I got uh, very interested if this fast protein enhances the replication of the other viruses other than the Nelson Bale viruses. So I prepared the mammalian real viruses and rotor viruses. So please remember they, they are not the fusogenic viruses. Then I also prepared the cells artificially induced cell to cell fusion by the expression of the fast protein, while another cells are left as a control cell. Then I examined the viral replication in these cells. Uh, so please, please confirm this is the phylogenetic tree of the family Leobiridae. So here is the Nelson Bale virus. This is the fusogenic viruses. And rotavirus and mammalian rare virus is not fusogenic viruses. Then I conducted that experiment. And very interestingly and importantly for me, the fast protein overexpression enhanced the replication of the mammalian rare viruses. And also enhanced the replication of the rotaviruses because they do not encode the fast protein. But when I tested the different viruses other than the family Leobiridae, for example, this, the encephalomyocarditis uh, viruses, this is from the picorna virus. And the vaccinia virus, this is the DNA viruses of the pox iride. The replication of these viruses were not enhanced by the expression of the fast protein. So it, it means that the, this, the phenomena, the enhancement of the viral replication is limited to the family uh, Leobiridae so far. So here is the summary slide so far. Uh, so I examined the biological role of the fast protein. So without the fast protein, so Nelson B. virus can replicate at uh, minimum level, 
but with the uh, fast protein in the inside the uh, few cells, the Nelson B. virus can replicate very well. The replication was uh, increased uh, the more than 104. And yes, the enhancement was also applied to the family Leobiride, but not applied to the other family uh, families, uh, including the Picornobiride or Paxpiride. And this fast protein uh, did, not, did not only contribute to the replication in the cells, but also in vivo. Okay, so this is very uh, scientifically important and interesting uh, result. But for me, the most important data is this one. The fast protein enhanced the replication of rotavirus. So please remember that my main purpose was to establish the liver synthesis of rotaviruses. So this is the previous slide. Uh, so I tried to recover the infectious viruses by uh, transfecting the uh, cloned viral gene to the cell, but failed, failed, failed again. But now I got this result, the fast protein enhanced the replication of rotavirus. So finally, I reached this system. So I prepared the rotavirus 11 gene segment and fast protein expression vector to expect to enhance the rotavirus replication. And in addition, I also prepared the plasmid expression vector, which caused the uh, RNA capping enzyme of the Pacinia virus. So I have expected this RNA capping enzyme to enhance the protein translation from the uh, plasmid, from the plasmid. So there is a, another long story for why I uh, noticed this uh, RNA capping enzyme, but uh, today I skipped this uh, background story. So anyway, so I prepared a total 14 plasmid, then transfect into the cells, and finally I got the infectious virus. This is the first case of the generation of the recombinant rotavirus from artificial gene. So we used the uh, rotavirus SA11 strain. This is a similar rotavirus strain. So I call this virus as a recombinant strain SA11, as a RS SA11. But firstly, the efficiency of the virus recovery was quite low. But the efficiency was subsequently much improved when the rotavirus NSP QNA and NSP5 was uh, co expressed. Then we generated the reverse genetics of human rotaviruses. So now we are ready to gene manipulation of rotaviruses and go to the further experiment. The by generation of the gene engineered rotaviruses. The technique can be applied to the vaccine development or the development of rotavirus vector and the study of the viral pathogenesis. So in the remaining time, so let me introduce a bit about the application of the rotavirus reverse genetics for development of rotavirus vaccine and rotavirus vector. The genotypes of the rotavirus are determined by the capsule protein, the VP4, and a VP7 on the surface of the virion. Then each determine the P and the G genotypes. Thus, the genotypes of the rotavirus are expressed as G1, P8. Uh, it's like a, a genotyping system of influenza virus. And a lot of uh, VP4 type and VP7 type have been recorded from human and animal uh, rotavirus strains, but actually the five uh, major serotypes described in this slide uh, account to more than the 90% of the circulating human rotavirus. The first rotavirus vaccine, uh, so-called Rotashield, was uh, used, uh, started for using in USA in 1998. This vaccine was very effective. And so, and this is, uh, important thing is that this is the attenuated live vaccine. But within one year of the usage, it was found that the risk of the intersusception increased. So this is the intersusception, so usually uh, sometimes found in the babies or infants. 
So the, uh, the inoculation of this vaccine increased that intersusception risk. And this vaccine was withdrawn, so within one year. Then we have to wait the second generation of rotavirus vaccine uh, in 2006. These two, uh, two vaccines developed in the 2006 were currently used worldwide in the more than 100 countries. Though these vaccines have reduced the rotavirus-related hospitalization and death dramatically, the next uh, rotavirus uh, vaccines are candidate under development because they have bit uh, problems, uh, bit problems uh, uh, in the current vaccines. So these uh, vaccines, uh, the current vaccine and candidate vaccines, uh, all live vaccines are using the attenuated uh, rotavirus strains because the inactivated vaccine for the rotavirus have been shown not enough to induce protective immunity. The virus attenuations were conducted by so far a so-called classical method. That is the vaccines uh, as shown in the above is uh, made by the ciliary passage in the cells for attenuation. And those vaccines that and those vaccines described in the below are the product of animal and human rotavirus chimeric viruses. And like influenza viruses, when cells are infected with the two different viruses, for example, animal and human rotaviruses, gene reassortment, gene exchange occur. And if you can select only the animal, uh, animal rotavirus backbone with the VP4 and VP7 protein from human viruses, it is attenuated but have antigenicity of the human rotavirus strain. However, the both classical methods are quite time consuming and the mutation during the serial passage cannot be regulated. The another concern about the rotavirus vaccine is that the effectiveness is variable between countries and region. In general, the rotavirus effective, uh, vaccine effectiveness is less in the low income countries, but uh, there was no scientific explanation of this phenomenon. The another scientific evidence to explain the variable vaccine uh, effectiveness is, <coughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, this is the scientific evidence to explain the variable vaccine effectiveness between the countries and regions. For example, uh, so this is the distribution of the genotypes of the rotavirus strain in different countries. For example, at uh, during this period, in, for example, in China, the G3 genotype was uh, the major G3 type was uh, dominant in China, followed by the G1. But in, for example, in India, the G2 was a um, major genotype and G1 is followed. So this genotype variability raises the motivation to develop country or region specific genotype matched rotavirus vaccine. And this graph shows another problem of the rotavirus vaccine. So this is, is epidemiological data in Scotland and comparing the before and after the vaccine introduction. The before start of the vaccination, the G1 P8 genotype was dominant in this country as shown in the blue bar. But after the vaccine introduction, this G1 genotype was reduced. This is a good effect of the vaccine. Uh, the vaccine prevents uh, endemic of this genotype. But the another genotype, for example, G2P4, become bit increased after the uh, vaccine introduction. This uh, phenomenon, we can say that the emergence of the escape mutant from the vaccine strains. So our idea is uh, so using the genetic reverse genetics approach to make the rotavirus vaccine is described here. So we are using the simian rotavirus strain strain SA11, but because this is the laboratory strain with a quite high replication capacity in cell culture. And we thought that once we generate the recombinant virus, uh, which is the SA11 backbone, 
but with the VP4 and VP7 protein uh, from human rotavirus clinical sample isolate, it can be the ideal vaccine strain with the high replication capacity and matched antigenicity to the human circulating viruses. Then we collected the human rotavirus isolated from the patient and amplified whole the VP4 and VP7 gene and cloned into the plasmid and used for the reverse genetics to generate the recombinant rotavirus. So please remind uh, that the replication of the human rotavirus clinical isolate uh, that I used a significantly lower replication rate than the SA11 rotavirus. Uh, so this is the laboratory strain of the simian rotavirus SA11 replication. It replicated very well, nearly the 10 to the 8 powers, but the replication of human rotavirus clinical samples are much lower than the, this SA11 virus. So, so I made the virus. Then firstly, I examined the antigenicity of the recombinant viruses using the monoclonal antibody. So I prepared the two monoclonal antibody. Ah, so no, no, just only the one monoclonal antibody. So called the MAB29. This MAB29 recognized VP4 of the SA11 viruses. The recognition site, uh, I identified that the arginine, uh, 441st position. This arginine is conserved between the SA11 and the human rotavirus VP4. But arginine, this arginine located within the somewhat uh, variable region. And in neutralization assay, MAB, so you see the black bar, here is a uh, high titer. Also, this indicated that the MAB29 monoclonal antibody neutralized wild type SA11 virus at very high titer. And in contrast, this antibody did not neutralize VP4 monoreassortant viruses at all. These viruses have the human VP4 protein in the SA backbone. And pro probably that this monoclonal antibody cannot recognize the human VP4 protein. So these viruses show the escape from the monoclonal antibody. But in contrast, that these VP4 reassortant viruses which has only the VP7 protein from the human rotaviruses were neutralized. So this is because these VP7 uh, reassortant viruses have the same VP4 protein of the parental SA11 viruses. So this neutralization assay was very clear, was very beautiful and verified the changes of the viral antigenicity by replacing the VP4 genes. So next, we conducted the neutralization assay using murine anti-SA11 antibody uh, serum. So I prepared the anti-serum uh, by the repeated infection of the, this SA11 in mice, then performed the neutralization assay. This anti-SA11 anti-serum neutralizes the SA11 very efficiently, of course. But the neutralization titer to the both VP4 or VP7 reassortant viruses were very low. This result verified again the altered antigenicity of the VP4 and VP7 mutant uh, reassortant viruses. And this result also uh, indicates the important uh, fact that the both VP4 and VP7 uh, individually contributed to the virus antigenicity genetically. And to determine the domains, for, I'm sorry, I should. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one slide. Oh, okay, may, okay, I continue. So I forgot just one slide, but uh, please see this graph. Oops, yeah. So I made uh, many, the VP4 or VP7 reassortant viruses, but I found that the replication of this kind of the VP4 
uh, resultant viruses, uh, the replication of this virus was very, very severely reduced. This is the replication of the wild type SA11. And when I changed the VP4 protein to the human rotavirus origin, this virus did not efficiently in the spiritual cell. And to find out the difference, uh, difference domain to determine the replication ability of the human and the simian rotavirus VP4, I prepared the chimeric VP4 between by changing the each domains uh, between the human, uh, between the human and the simian rotaviruses. And finally, I found uh, by replacing the uh, this region, this is the VP8 region, uh, making the forming the head of the VP4 protein is important to, to, to determine the virus uh, infectivity. And also I confirmed that this the importance of the VP4 protein for to determine the virus infectivity or the ability of the virus replication. I changed, I made another viruses. So firstly, I uh, I made a virus and in the SA11 backbone by changing the VP4 of the human rotavirus origin, and the replication of this virus become very 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 low. Then I prepared the virus uh, in the human rotavirus backbone with the SA11 VP4. If virus uh, the VP4 determine the virus infectivity, the replication of this virus should become increased. So uh, please notice this graph. So this is the black line is the replication of the parental SA11. This is the simian viruses. And this blue is the parental wild type human rotaviruses. There is a significant uh, difference between the virus replication. But when I test the replication of these viruses, human rotavirus backbone with the uh, simian rotavirus VP4, the replication of this virus recovered. So this indicating that the replication, uh, different replication of the SA11 viruses and human rotavirus is the mostly determined by the, this the cell attaching protein VP4. Okay, so then, so this is the last part of my talk. So now we move on to the story of the developing rotavirus vector. So you may know about the virus vector. Yes, uh, for example, the adenovirus vector is now currently used for the vaccine development of the COVID-19 uh, produced by the AstraZeneca. And such a virus vector is a system to transfer foreign gene to the target cell. Once you make the recombinant viruses with the foreign gene you know, within the virus genome, this virus can uh, infect to the target cells and express the uh, gene of the interest inside the cells. So the virus vectors can be used for the gene therapy and vaccine vectors. But you must think about the infection tropies on, of each viruses it depends on the according to the cells and that virus you uh, used. For example, the Lynch and rotoviruses are favorably uh, infect the, the blood cells, uh, blood lymphocyte in the human bodies, and adenoviruses can uh, effectively infect in the upper respiratory uh, uh, organs. And as far as I know, the virus vector which can target the small intestine is limited to certain cell types of adeno-associated virus vector. And now, so the, my idea is that the rotavirus can become an, uh, the virus vector which can target to the enteric organs because the rotavirus is a natural infection causing the small intestine. For example, if I make the rotavirus expressing the norovirus PP1 antigen, or the HIV gag antigen or viral chorelatoxin, this rotavirus vector can be used for the, uh, not only the rotavirus vaccine, but also the these enteric pathogens. 
So to make the rotavirus vector, at first I try to make the rotavirus expression system. The rotavirus has an NSP1 protein. Uh, this NSP1 acts as an interferon antagonist. And it was known that the NSP1 was not essential for the virus replication. So I inserted the nanolook luciferase. This is a kind of luciferase gene that make a light on the fireflies. And I inserted this gene within uh, NSP1 protein. And in this gene construct, the, uh, the nanoroc gene is expressed as a fusion protein of the NSP1, 1 to 27 peptide. And the latter half of the NSP protein is not expressed express because this is the subcodon. And by the reverse genetics, I rescued the SA level nanoroc virus. Uh, this electrophoresis, the virus genome reveals the presence of, the, here is the natural uh, world type NSP1, and here is the higher band of NSP1 and rock chimeric gene here. And this virus can replicate and made a plaque, and these plaques were detected by the, uh, visualized by the Rushfield signal. The replication of the SA11 N look was bit lower than the wild type by the, because this virus did not express the functional NSP1. Oops. Then, uh, so usually the stability of the foreign gene is uh, the pro bit problem. Yeah, so when we used working with uh, viral vector. So to examine the genetic stability of the nanoroc gene in the rotavirus vector. So I passaged this SA11 nanoroc for total 10 times in the cell culture. The passage one and the passage five virus exhibited high luciferase activity, but the luciferase expression was reduced in the passage 10 viruses. Then I examined the gene electrophoresis pattern of the passage one, passage five, and passage 10 viruses. And in this figure, so you see the passage one viruses keep the higher NSP1 nanochimeric gene but this higher band uh, is disappeared in the passage 10 viruses, but instead the shorter band, bit shorter but a bit higher than the NSP, uh, parent NSP1 gene emerged. Then I examined this shorter band uh, found in the P5 and passage 10, and uh, found that the deletion of nanoloc gene uh, resulted in the reconstitution of the functional NSP1 is uh, happened. So it was assumed that once NSP1 gene, uh, once the NLOC gene is removed and a functional NSP1 is reconstituted and virus replication was better improved and become dominant within a few replication cycle. So thus, to avoid the reconstitution of NSP1 gene, I introduced the deletion in NSP1 untranslated region, or here, so I made a deletion. The new virus, SA11 nanoroc delta 332, this virus kept NSP1 nanoroc long gene, so even after the 10, uh, 10 times passages. Further, so to confirm this result, so I uh, generated another, another virus, so-called SA11 nanoroc delta 11110. This virus also kept the NSP1 and chimeric gene stably uh, after 10 passages. And the nanoroc activities of these viruses did, did not change after 10 times passages, so indicating this nanoroc gene is stably kept uh, among these viruses. Then I applied this reporter virus system to make the vaccine vector for norovirus. Norovirus is another enteric virus causing severe diarrhea and vomit. The, since the replication of the norovirus in cell culture is quite low, the vaccine production of the norovirus is uh, not progressed so far. So instead, the norovirus-like particle uh, Yes, this is the norovirus-like virus -like particle formed by the norovirus PP1 protein is now under development by the several companies for the vaccine candidate. 
So I think if I make the rotavirus vector expressing the norovirus VP1 protein, it forms a virus like, like particle uh, and form the, uh, it makes a virus like particle uh, in the cells and available as a rotavirus and norovirus dual vaccine vector. And so to make the vaccine vector, the norovirus VP1 was inserted within the NSP1 gene. And I made a deletion in the, at the NSP1 rata region that was not translated. And also the two express the native VP1 gene, the ATG codon within the NSP1 gene was uh, removed. So this gene was uh, translated from this uh, exact start code of the norovirus VP1. So I made a virus, the so-called NSP1 norovirus uh, VP1. This virus has long NSP1 VP1 gene. And the replication of this virus was a bit lower than the world type virus because this virus did not express functional NSP1. And the expression of the norovirus VP1 protein was confirmed by the Western protein. Yeah, of course, you see the world type SA11 did not express the VP1. So, uh, so through my presentation, I introduced the story from the establishment of the reverse genetics and the reverse genetics approach for development of vaccine and the virus vector. And in addition, so we are now struggling to uncover the molecular mechanism of, of viral pathogenesis. Here. For example, the world type rotavirus infection causes severe diarrhea as shown here in the suckling mice. So this is, I inoculate the rotavirus in the, uh, just a three days age of mice in, uh, uh, orally. And these mice uh, showed the severe diarrhea in the 100%. Then I made uh, many uh, types of the mutant rotaviruses with randomized uh, amino acid mutation and found that some of the mutant viruses did not cause uh, uh, diarrhea in mice. And these viruses can be applied for the alternative vaccine strains. So, so in our group, so three uh, species of the real viruses of the family Leovidia uh, studied for the different purposes. Uh, this is the for virulence, uh, mechanism of the virulence and vaccine de development. And the Nelson BLA virus uh, used for the peculiar uh, fast protein function. And this mammalian also real virus is developing for the oncolytic virus vector by the gene engineering. And there are many researchers for the rotavirus and Nelson BLA virus and mammalian viruses worldwide. But most of them working only on their own single viruses, there are less communication between the people on the different viruses. And uh, as far as uh, I know, only our group uh, studied these three uh, viruses at the same times. And as I showed the examples about the fast protein of Nelson BLA virus and rotavirus reverse genetic system, there are many good cross talk between the outcome of each viruses. Uh, for me, the working on the different viruses made the positive feedbacks and contributed to improve my research. Okay, thank you very much. So this. My work is supported by my many researchers um, and many my friends. I would appreciate all my collaborators and I would uh, also appreciate uh, to, today the audience and staffs and Dr. Bimo who prepared this uh, seminar presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuta. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for the explanation. Uh, such an interesting presentation. And now we're entering the second discussion. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please raise your hand or chat through the chat box about the second session or maybe the first session.
No, I, I think uh, this presentation includes a lot of the molecular biologies. So you may need oh, one question. So you may need a, a bit a basic knowledge regarding the molecular biology. What the gene is? What the plasmid is? What the transfection is? So a bit maybe difficult for the graduate uh, undergraduate student. So just one question there, from one question Dajin, Diana. Thank you very much. So so I have a question about the rotavirus. Now, what study found that the human rotavirus has a reassortant with equine like uh, G3P8 in the VP7 gene, cosine in the VP4 gene, and boba in the NSP4 gene? How about that? Did the reassortment come from animals or how? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank so, uh, so as this, uh, as commented by the, the in Diana, so there are a lot of the uh, natural reassortment between the human and animal rotaviruses uh, uh, found, especially between the human and uh, pigs and human, sometimes human with bovine. And actually nobody knows about how and where that this reassortment occurs. But this kind of uh, reassortment, especially the human and the pig rotavirus, was usually found in the pig farmers or the pigs. Probably they have the pig farmer and the pigs are very close contact. And um, probably, uh, I, I don't think the pigs get the infection from humans, but the human can get uh, infection from the pigs because we can sometimes very close contact to the pig feces. So once the human gets the pig uh, porcine rotavirus infection, the probably the reassortant occur in the human, human. But this is the hypothesis nobody knows, even in influenza, we don't know where where and when this kind of animal and human reassortant occurs. The second question is that uh, I'm also interested in the skip mutant of rotavirus vaccine. What causes this phenomenon to occur? Okay, thank you very much. So this is very important. And so, uh, so at first, the important thing is that the current vaccine is so available, they are used for the worldwide is the two vaccines, so-called Rotarix and Rotatic. They, they are very effective and very accepted for the worldwide use. But in some countries, this kind of phenomena of escape uh, is recorded. It's the same as the uh, phenomena of the current coronaviruses, of the influenza viruses. Uh, for example, you may know the example of the influenza viruses. Influenza is known to show the rapid mutation every year. So only just the, only the single uh, the amino acid mutation sometimes cause the escape. Even if it's uh, not the complete escape, uh, it can be how to say the advantage, the replication advantage other than the wild type viruses. So the at the under the vaccine pressure, wild type viruses can be completely suppressed. But the soon, the escape mutant can survive. And uh, the replication, during the replication of that, the first primary escape mutant, escape mutant can further get another mutation, which can uh, more make a more escape from the vaccine strain. The, the, this is the mechanism of the uh, production of the mutant viruses. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe there, there's another questions for Dr. Any other question? Maybe enough. Kania, enough. No question? Uh, okay, no more questions for the second session.
Okay, I think uh, that's all for the discussion session for the second session. I would like to give an, a little conclusion about uh, the topic that we had today. So the first is the most highly fatality viruses are associated with pets. And based on the research, there are so many viruses that can be transmitted from animals to humans, especially uh, bats and pongolians. With the Marburg virus is the highest deadly virus and also others like Nipah virus, Hendra virus, SARS-CoV and also mars -CoV. Because pets has a unique balance between virus host events and human tolerance of pathogens after rodents. So that's why most of the virus outbreak is associated to the pets. And also for the nascent Bay orthorevirus or NBV, rotavirus and mammalian rivers are members of the photogenic orthorevirus that have various host species, including reptiles, birds, and mammals. Isolations of this pathogenic rivers raises concerns about the potential emerging infections of the bedborne viruses in humans. So the perspective about the reverse genetics of Varina virus could establish the recombinant virus also developed that to be applied to the study of propagation and pathogenic, pathogenesis or pathogenic, hopefully for future generations, recombinant MBV could be used for other future diagnostic vaccine and therapeutics. For the next session is giving certificate to the speaker by veterinary basic medicine division. To the Dr. Roma Kurnia Santi DVM, the time is yours. Mut, Santi, di mut, mut, mut. Joksan, di unmut, unmut dulu, di unmut. Make-nya mati. Sampun, sampun. Yeah. Oke, okay, thank you Mr. Juta as the speaker at the guest lecture for the basic veterinary medicine division. I hope this collaboration can continue. Thank you, Mr. Juta. Thank you very much. Thank you also for me. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Vimo. It's a good, nice chance, yeah. Yes. I, I want to be with you. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation. It's my interest. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Mr. Juta. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting. Very transparent. Anya, lanjut. Okay. Uh, I think that's all for today. And for the speakers and the participants, thank you. Such a great presentations and topics. Hopefully, this lecture will bring so much benefits and new knowledge to everyone. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Juta. Thank you. Mr. Juta, thank you. Taya, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. Mr. Juta? Yes. If you okay. okay, so thank you very much, Mimo. It's a, this is I, I was very happy. Okay. So you 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 yeah. Okay. okay. So okay. So I will leave now. Okay. Okay. See you later again. Later. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Mr. Yuta. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Baik, kan ya di share untuk yang itu belum ya? Sertanya tinggal sedikit. Oh, ya sudah nggak apa-apa wis, ya nggak usah nggak apa-apa wis. Wis nggak apa-apa. Iya.
uh, untuk partisipan yang ada di guest lecture di KDV kita punya jurnal uh, jurnal basic of uh, jurnal of basic Medi medical veterinary uh, ini terbit setahun sekali dan sudah OJS online jurnal system dan ini kita sudah rutin dan yang Juni sudah terbit. Silahkan kalau eh, mahasiswa atau eh, para staf dosen ingin publikasi ke jurnal kami, kami terbuka dan gratis. Ya, silahkan eh, ini akan menuju, insya Allah akan menuju ke Sinta. Kami usahakan dalam tahun ini menuju ke Sinta. Dan ini mudah sekali, nanti tinggal uh, masuk linknya. Mungkin uh, bisa di-share linknya daripada, uh, dari jurnal Basic Medical Veterinary, Mas Gigi. Syarat-syaratnya sudah ada semua di, uh, di link jurnal of Basic Medical Veterinary ini. Sementara kita kita memuat per tahun per tahunnya 10 artikel. Jadi tiap terbitan 5 artikel. Ini nanti akan kami share juga mungkin di grup dosen beserta linknya. Baik, uh, mungkin Mas Kiki bisa share link-nya. Atau kalau tidak sempat link share link-nya, nggak apa-apa, nanti saya share di grup-grup. Oh, uh, sudah ada di chat room link untuk masuk ke jurnal kita, jurnal di KDV, Jurnal of Basic Medical Veterinary. Jadi di situ sudah ada link-nya, silahkan kalau uh, ingin memasukkan artikelnya, mudah-mudahan akan menuju ke akreditasi Sinta. Sampai Juni sudah terbit dan sudah kita buat untuk DOI-nya. Baik, Pak Bimo. Oke, terima kasih. Mungkin pertemuan guest selector selanjutnya kita... Ya. Terima kasih banyak atas kehadiran Bapak Ibu, adik-adik mahasiswa. Semoga apa yang kita dapatkan hari ini dari guest lecture bermanfaat, menambah pengetahuan kita. Dan itu tadi bagus sekali, menarik sekali, banyak sekali hasil penelitian yang dihasilkan oleh Dr. Yuta. Tapi mau. Ya. Tapi mau. Ya, ya. Yang non pati, patogen gimana? Mikroba non patogen. Sudah ketemu? Ah, ya, ya temannya dia juga ada profesor uh, mikrobiologi. Ini ini yang ya. memberikan ini anu ya. Enak, sederhana PPT-nya, gampang ditangkap. Ya. Ya. Hasil ya. hasil penelitiannya bagus-bagus. Penelitiannya bagus. Ya. Ya. Nah, nah, itu, itu, itu yang dulu dia tawarkan ke saya. Tapi hmm. karena pandemi nggak nggak memungkinkan. Kalau teman-teman tertarik nanti kita bisa join lagi. Iya boleh, oh. boleh Pak Bimo. Mudah-mudahan kalau pandemi ini kan bisa ya. Dia ya. mau mau ngajak ke screening tentang nipa. Ya. Malbel. Siap. Siap. Kita ya. tur tur lab ke Jepang ya. Ini nanti ya KTV ya. Ya Insya Allah. Mudah-mudahan Belmawa dana Belmawanya cair oh, ya Pak Supaya. Iya. Oh, ya penelitian. Lab-nya beliau. Ini ya, yang di Mangke itu ya. Indonesia itu kan banyak ya. Makaka, makaka. Makaka itu ya. Itu bisa ya. dieksplor virus apa saja yang di situ. Ya. Mungkin ya. sebenarnya ya. ini ilmunya kadek juga nih. Antibodinya aja itu mungkin antibodi apa aja yang mungkin dari antibodinya gitu aja. Kalau sudah ada antibodi kan pernah dia terinfeksi gitu ya. Nah. Jadi 
Jadi dia aja untuk screening untuk beberapa penyakit yang zoonosis berasal dari bed. Misalnya. Ya, Tadi ada market, nipa, kemudian ada peterovin virus. Indonesia sih banyak. Banyak. Nah, nah, bikin, dan, bikin roadmap-nya. Roadmap-nya dibikin. Dokter Kade, nah. ayo. Itu tahun Adik. pertama maaf, kita... Maaf, maaf, sih. Sebentar ya. Ini anu apa? Record-nya di-stop dulu. Nah, itu, <laughs> masih, masih live streaming. <laughs> eh, kalau mau rembukan gini di... di, di di tempat terpisah. Ya, 